Good morning uh, and welcome to the 21st meeting in 2015 of the Health and Sport Committee. And I, as I usually do at this point, can I ask people to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they sometimes can interfere with uh, the sound system. Although I should also point out that, as you can see, there are many around the table using uh, tablet devices instead of our hard copies of our papers. The first item on today's agenda is subordinate legislation. Uh, this is consideration of an affirmative instrument. Uh, as usual with uh, an affirmative instrument, we will have an evidence taken session with the Minister uh, and his officials on, uh, the, uh, on the instrument. And once we have had all our questions answered, we will have the formal debate on the motion. Um, uh, the instrument before us today is the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002, Amendment Order 2015. And can I welcome to the committee Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Sport, uh, Health Improvement and Mental Health, and Susie Brown, uh, Head of Independent Living Fund Scotland, Implementation, Care, Support and Rights Division. And Victoria MacDonald, uh, Senior Principal Legal Officer, Directorate for Legal Services, Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, I believe you would wish to make a brief opening statement? Uh, indeed, Please do. Uh, yeah. It should be uh, very brief. Uh, as uh, members will uh, undoubtedly be aware, the UK Government is closing the Independent Living Fund, uh, known as ILF, on the 30th of June uh, 2015. It has already closed to new applicants. It's been closed for some time, since 2010. In Scotland, we have announced our commitment to a new national Scottish ILF to safeguard the interests of the 2,831 existing Scottish users and to ensure the fund's long-term future. We've also announced our commitment to open the fund to new users for the first time since 2010, with funding of £5 million for 2015-16 being made available to do this. ILF provides discretionary cash payments to disabled people to enable them to purchase care or support from an agency or pay wages of a privately employed personal assistant. Payments offer people the flexibility they may not otherwise have to live in their own home, take up employment or uh, to education or indeed to socialise uh, like other uh, members of society. We have established the new organisation, ILF Scotland, to administer ILF awards. This will be fully operational by the 1st of July 2015 and all existing Scottish ILF users will transfer to ILF Scotland from this date. The purpose of that order and council uh, before us is to add ILF Scotland to the jurisdiction of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. This will allow complaints about ILF Scotland to be dealt with by the Ombudsman and will help to ensure an effective and robust complaints handling procedure. The policy is that once the internal ILF Scotland complaints handling processes have been exhausted, a complainant should have the right to an external tier of redress via the Ombudsman, just as it is already the case for many uh, public bodies uh, across Scotland. The ability to complain to an independent ombudsman is an important right. The order will therefore ensure that ILF Scotland is operating in line with similar service providers in Scotland. And I'm happy at this stage convinced to answer any questions members may have. Thank you, Minister. Uh, do the members have any questions? Rhoda Grant. Just a very quick question. In that there's a period of time where the, the scheme is not covered, a period of days. I'm just trying to find my, my notes and my papers here. Um, what happens if there's an issue there? I assume that given the short time period, there would be the opportunity to take up the complaint after that? Yes, well, um, you're right, uh, Ms Grant, in that it will be a very uh, short period of time, this uh, order. It should go before Privy Council on the 15th of July and should come into effect immediately thereafter. So we're essentially talking about a period of two weeks. Uh, I should uh, point out that the number of complaints uh, that we uh, imagine, of course, we can only estimate because you never know how many people will ultimately claim. Ideally, we'd like no one uh, to complain, uh, but um, people should have that right to complain. And we estimate there could only be about three that end up with the Ombudsman in any given year uh, in the first instance. So I would say that the likelihood of there being any in that intervening period is pretty low, but nonetheless there is the possibility. So uh, during uh, that interim period, if there are complaints arising uh, where there could be a need for external redress, they would be dealt with uh, by the current sole director of ILF Scotland, who is the Deputy Director of Care, Support and Rights within uh, the Scottish Government, and that role is consistent with the uh, other interim responsibilities of uh, the sole director, uh, who is carrying out this role until the point when the new ILF Scotland Chair and Board of Directors are appointed. So. 
there is uh, an interim measure, but uh, the likelihood of it being utilised is pretty low. Uh, famous last words, of course. Any other members? There are no other members. Um, uh, I, I don't expect the, the minister that we want to say any more. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. For me too. We now move to agenda item number two, uh, which is the f formal debate on the affirmative instrument. Uh, we have just taken the evidence on. Uh, I invite the minister to move. Uh, motion S4M13561. It moved, convener. Thank you. Uh, do any members wish to contribute to the debate? They don't. Uh, then, uh, Minister, uh, I don't expect you would wish to sum up to any of that absence you're, of the debate. You're no. correct, Um, um uh, So I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M13561 be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. Um, thank the officials for their, 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 their moving now, aren't they? Yeah. I'll just, I'll just pause for a moment while we set up. Uh, we now move to uh, our th third item on the agenda today, which is a final evidence session on Carer Scotland Bill. Um, the Minister has been joined by um, a, a new set of uh, officials and uh, supporting them in this, in this area. Um, and can I welcome to the committee Dr uh, Maureen Bruce, uh, Deputy Director, Care Support and Rights Division, Population Health Improvements Director. Uh, Ruth Linney, uh, Principal Legal Officer, uh, and Moira Oliphant, Team Leader, Carers Branch, Care Support and Rights Division, Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Uh, before before I uh, you know begin, um, uh, you know I think uh, we we discussed it earlier that I would like to place on record uh, the committee's thanks to a group of young carers who spent um, you know some time with us la last last Thursday. Um, to share their experiences uh, of their caring roles um, uh, and their views on the bill. And I, 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 you know, I think I would like to put on record that uh, I'm sure I and the other members, uh, uh, you know, gave us uh, uh, moments uh, of reflection there about their experience and, and the actual reality of caring and being a young person. And it was quite varied, but there were very, very, very good evidence. So we'd like them to th uh, uh, thank them for that. And, and indeed, at this point, if you don't mind, Minister, if, uh, Bob, do you want to say anything about that session? Just, or just, any, anybody else just quickly? very, very briefly, convener, and, and I'm sure the Minister will be really interested to know just how much the young carers valued uh, the support of the Princess Royal uh, Trust Carer Centre in Falkirk and uh, <coughs> how a lot of them had completely lacked information on the support available for young carers until they, they found that, that vital resource and maybe just put on record two things that, that particularly come up in relation to things that are also in the bill. They were, they, they were absolutely convinced that the need for short breaks were, were vital in, in supporting them, not just to be a carer but to be a normal young person getting on with their life, separate from caring responsibilities, and the status they, they felt they need more of in relation to the healthcare system when the cared for person uh, was, was maybe taken into hospital unexpectedly and, and that kind of thing. I mean, that, I'm sure that will tease out during the evidence session anyway, convener, but just given that the young people said that to us, yeah. it's just nice to get that on the record at the start of this session. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, th thanks, and I'm sure it may come up in, 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 the, in the rest of it. But, Minister, uh, you, you wish to give an, an opening statement? Indeed, uh, convener, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to say 
uh, a few words about uh, the Carers Bill and why I believe it's uh, important to both adult and young carers are uh, integral to our uh, society. They provide vital care and support to their families, friends and neighbours. Can I thank uh, the committee for its scrutiny of the bill uh, thus far? It's uh, very positive to hear about your very productive session with uh, young carers. I know you've had other evidence sessions as well. I want to thank the committee for the work it's undertaken uh, so far. Uh, can we, we have uh, seen much uh, progress in supporting carers. I hear directly from carers about how their lives have changed for the better and their personal outcomes achieved as a result of the support they received. The Scottish Government has invested over £114 million between 2007 to 2015 in a range of programmes and initiatives to support carers. We are investing further uh, this financial year. Some carers, however, are not being uh, supported. This can have a diverse impact on carers' physical, emotional and financial well-being. Uh, that is, I'm sure, a concern for us all. It is also uh, a concern that uh, carers can experience very challenging circumstances, including economic and social disadvantage. Sometimes uh, young carers don't have uh, the best uh, childhood. I see a crucial role for the Bill in complementing important uh, policies and drivers such as the integration of health and social care and the rollout of self-directed support. Integrating in health and social care with the uh, progressive rollout of integrated joint boards is vital in providing seamless services and empowering local communities to take charge of their own health and well-being in innovative ways. Uh, there is I believe a key role for new legislation to accelerate and sustain the progress that has already been made to bring about a step change in the way that services support carers and to inspire renewed ambition about uh, supporting carers. This is within a, a wider context which is really important. As we all know, Scotland has a growing population of older people successfully living longer but often doing so with a range of complex and multiple physical and mental health care needs. There are more children with complex health needs or disabilities. We need to support Scotland's carers so that they in turn can support the many people with illnesses and disabilities or who are frail, many with dementia. 47% of carers live in the most deprived, deprived areas, caring for uh, 35 hours a week or more. It is striking that this is almost double uh, the level in the least deprived areas. We need to support carers who experience considerable disadvantage, especially if the impact of caring is taking its toll. Therefore, our wider work to tackle health inequalities within the even wider context of tackling economic disadvantage is crucial. Uh, the Carers Bill is a fundamental part of delivering uh, this wider strategy to tackle inequalities and of the work we are doing to deliver the Scottish Government's vision for carers. Our vision is that carers, whatever their circumstances, should enjoy the same opportunities in life as people without caring responsibilities. It is my intention that Scotland's carers should be better supported on a more consistent basis so that they can continue to care, if they so wish, in good health and to have a life alongside caring. The objective of the Bill is to make real this ambition by furthering the rights of both adult and young carers. The Bill is designed to deliver fundamentals such as care and involvement and participation, comprehensive yet person-centred support planning, preventative and community-based approaches to supporting carers, and strategic overview and development through the local carer strategies. I believe that this Bill strikes the right balance in making the necessary requirements of local authorities and health boards to deliver support for carers and providing the flexibility to ensure a personalised approach to support. In reviewing uh, the evidence from a wide range of interests, I think it's clear that there is broad support for the Bill's principles. We have listened carefully to carers and care organisations developing the Bill's provisions. I hope that uh, carers will be able to recognise their voices in the Bill as it stands. As I uh, already set out in the Members' Business Debate on Carers in the name of uh, Ms Grant in the uh, Parliament on the 10th of June, uh, I welcome any suggestions that seek to improve the Bill and the lives of carers and young carers across Scotland. We're already engaging with important stakeholder interests to further consider their views. I will, of course, give full consideration to all good suggestions as we take uh, this legislation forward. And hopefully, a uh, convener have been able to demonstrate that willingness with the Mental Health Bill, which, of course, we debate at Stage 3 tomorrow. It's my intention uh, to proceed on that basis with this bill as well. Uh, I look forward to, con uh, forward to the continued consideration of uh, this bill by the committee and uh, the contribution that scrutiny and consideration can make to its improvement. I also look forward to the discussion we're about to have uh, and any questions members may have. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Minister. Our first question is from Dennis Robertson. Thank you, convener. And good morning, Minister, and good morning to your officials. Minister, <clears throat> you'll be aware that we've taken evidence from <clears throat> a number of carers and carers' organisations. And one of the things that's been uh, uh, brought to our attention is the areas around criteria. 
And there's a concern that if the criteria remains with the local authorities, uh, and of course local authorities are saying this is a necessary thing to so they can reflect local need, but from the carers and organisations, they're saying that they would like some degree of certainty and stability because if it's set locally by the authorities, they feel that many carers may not meet the criteria and this would not reflect your aims to try and ensure that carers have a life out with that caring role. How would you try and uh, reassure our carers and those the organisations that have brought those concerns forward? Thank you for the uh, question, Ms Robertson. I suppose uh, this is essentially a balance between trying to ensure a more consistent approach but also recognising that the same instance that each local authority is uh, a body corporate in its own right. It also has its own uh, democratic accountability. Each local authority is, of course, elect and ultimately accountable to its own uh, electorate. But I certainly would recognise that the, uh, the intention of this bill is, of course, to uh, ensure better support uh, for uh, carers uh, uh, across uh, the board. We have uh, a duty uh, in uh, the bill for each local authority to set the local eligibility criteria which is to apply in its area. Of course, each local authority must publish its local criteria. Local criteria have to be reviewed every three years. Three years. Uh, we uh, took uh, the decision to have local criteria in order to ensure uh, local decision-making, but uh, overlaid by what uh, is termed in the bill as such matters as the Scottish ministers may by regulations uh, specify. Uh, so, when each local authority sets its local uh, uh, eligibility criteria, it has to have a regard to that uh, na national uh, direction and, of course, we will consult on those uh, regulations. So this, I suppose, is essentially um, a balance between uh, recognising the uh, intention of the bill uh, to ensure a better, more consistent uh, level of support for carers, but also recognising, on the other hand, that local authorities are ultimately democratic and elected bodies themselves. From your statement, Minister, does this mean that if you feel that the criteria is being set too low and therefore many carers are not being included uh, in that uh, uh, eligibility for support, you would intervene? What we will, uh, of course, do is we will monitor the implementation of this bill as uh, Parliament would expect us to do so. We will pay particular interest as to what the uh, the efficacy of the provision is and how it's actually been rolled out on the ground. What I should uh, point out is we have uh, retained within uh, the bill the ability that should it be uh, determined necessary that uh, by way of uh, regula regulations we could set uh, national criteria. Now, uh, my uh, clear preference is that we uh, don't get to that stage, that we don't need to get to that stage, that we have uh, the uh, national direction set out, uh, as is set out in the bill, as I've said, such matters as Scottish ministers may, uh, by regulation, specify that uh, local eligibility criteria has to uh, refer to. So it's overlaid uh, with that uh, uh, national uh, guidance, as it were. That's my uh, preferred approach, but it should ultimately be felt necessary. At some point down the line, we could uh, institute national uh, eligibility criteria. So if individual carers or organisations feel that criteria uh, are being, or eligibility for support has been set too low, they can approach uh, either local authority uh, and if they don't get a, um, a satisfactory outcome there, uh, they could come back to government and say this is, uh, we are not being treated fairly, it is not meeting the objectives and outcomes set uh, by the, the government in terms of giving people this life outside of caring, you would intervene. Even if I wanted to say to the national care organisations, you you can't raise this with uh, me as the minister responsible, they would be raising it with me uh, anyway. Of course, we are in regular contact with uh, the national care organisations on a range of issues, not least uh, this uh, bill. So if they had uh, concerns, then I would expect them to be uh, raising it with me. But I suppose the, the point is we want to get it right at the outset, and of course there is within uh, the uh, bill, there is the uh, necessity for uh, carers and uh, care organisations to be involved 
uh, locally in terms of local care strategies and also in terms of the uh, application of uh, local Elizabeth criteria, they should be involved in uh, drafting and coming up with what uh, that should mean. So uh, this is about empowering carers. They have to be involved in that process as well. I understand some of the concerns though, in terms of, say, for instance, a family moves from one local authority area to another, the eligibil eligibility for support may be different. So they may drop out of support from one local authority to another. I, mean, I can understand that perspective. I suppose the, the, the key thing for me is that the eligibility criteria within an area it has to be clear. So it has to be clear to those within a particular local authority area what the eligibility criteria uh, must be. Um, you know, by its very nature of its uh, local eligibility criteria, there could be uh, some differences from one local authority area to the other, but notwithstanding the point I've made that any local eligibility criteria has to be informed uh, by the, uh, by the uh, matters that we've set out uh, by uh, regulations. Uh, there is, uh, of course, also the power in the bill to support uh, carers on a, a more uh, general basis, those who do not meet eligibility criteria so you know this bill is written through uh, in uh, terms of uh, an approach that's uh, designed to support carers. And finally convener, um, with the integration of health and social care which you know I, I think there's general support for that I think uh, in, in all sections of the, the community and society um, but there is going to be a greater emphasis on local authorities to meet the need moving from acute services to primary care. And therefore, um, local authorities are suggesting there's going to be a greater burden on them. Does that not, um, to some extent, mean that there could be a dilution of a, a care and support for those that, that we're referring to within this bill? because they're actually looking at the, the authorities are sort of maybe prioritising um, those coming from the acute into primary care services? Uh, no, I don't think there's uh, evidence to suggest that it should uh, be the case. I think, uh, the, I think we're all supportive of the integration agenda. It's about trying to ensure a, a more seamless uh, interaction between uh, health service and uh, social care. I, I can't uh, envisage what the particular uh, challenge might be. Of course, it is uh, true that we want to get more folk uh, out of uh, acute services into uh, primary care, into community uh, settings. I think actually the, this bill could be a significant advance in helping to achieve that because one of the barriers right now might be that uh, carers don't feel they're particularly well supported uh, to uh, in their caring role, and that can it caused delays in that uh, transfer just now. So I think by its very nature, this bill can actually help that process. Really, the challenge is a resource one. Minister. Well, of course, uh, we have uh, set out uh, a significant uh, resource in the financial uh, memorandum over uh, the lifetime that uh, we have set out the, the forecast. Um, we will, uh, of course, uh, resource the, the provisions of this bill. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was a wee bit surprised saying you, you, you weren't aware of any of the concerns in and around that because I think much of what Dennis was referring to is and some of the evidence that we've had is that while lots of people including lots of people here support the principles of this bill um, the the challenges of delivering increased expectation I think have been well versed by COSLA in terms of the number of people who may uh, if we go beyond the, the regular and substantial test for carers and go to a universal uh, position, the, the numbers that are being in, in, uh, estimated in the financial me memorandum will be greater than, than what's been laid out. Um, so we've got that various evidence from various professional uh, organisations, if you like, the the producers of uh, 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 producer side of the story, the people who are actually paid to deliver this, and but on the other side of the story, uh, I've got to say that we have had that uh, in a couple of the evidence sessions uh, with carers uh, when uh, you know we found ourselves explaining the position about why it would be a good idea 
to uh, extend uh, and identify carers at an earlier stage. Uh, you know, the carers themselves, through their experience, whether that be the difficulties of being assessed, getting an appropriate assessment, getting appropriate help right at this time. Young carers last week were saying, well, if we do this, what will that, how... How, how will that impact on me? Uh, older carers that we met in Glasgow were saying, you know, it's, things are difficult enough. If we broaden this out, if we increase this expectation, there is a concern that we may lose out. I think, uh, you know, Nanette, do you want to supplement that? Or, uh, you know, in terms of the... Can I relate to the Slightly different topic. So maybe well, the I'll, I'll let the Minister uh, answer then. Well, of course, I would recognise that uh, in any... A demand-led process, which this is ultimately what we are instituting. There are difficulties in coming up with a, a forecast. A, a convener, we are a confident that our a forecast is a, an appropriate one. I, I know that COSLA have expressed concerns about that. That explored that with a, the Finance Committee a, just a, recently. I would a, say that I think the removal of the regular and substantial test, a, which I think is a positive a step. I think it's a, a sensible thing to do to uh, broaden out the scope of uh, carers who should be eligible for uh, assessment and uh, potentially for uh, support after being assessed. I think the removal of that test will not in itself uh, result uh, in a large increase in numbers of uh, carers requesting uh, an adult care support plan because the majority of councils, as known, do not uh, use that test uh, just now. Indeed, we've supportive quotes from uh, councils uh, for, um, about removing uh, this barrier to assessment. Uh, Aberdeenshire Council say it will improve equity and uh, consistency. Uh, those who uh, decline a care assessment now may not want uh, the new adult care support plan. Some uh, might. Uh, perhaps those who feel the current assessment is stigmatising, but uh, others may decline the assessment because they are content to be involved with the community care assessment with the care for person or they don't feel themselves to be a carer, which is in itself an issue we may touch on, or they feel uh, supported already. Um, we also know that carers as a group, and again this is an issue in itself, but the carers as a group who don't come forward quickly for support, carers allowance is a case uh, in uh, point. Um, uh, so I think you know we're dealing with a low baseline, and uh, the forecast for demand I think is not a, an unreasonable one. But I would accept it's obviously uh, difficult to come up with a, an absolute a certain figure uh, when you're dealing with what is uh, a demand-led uh, process. Yes, I'm not arguing with the principle. I'm trying to articulate the concerns of carers who have an evidence told us uh, over a period of time. It sometimes can be a, a long wait to get assessed and, and, and a package put in place. And they say, if it took me that long, if we're opening, if, if people are going to be assessing others with a with a, a low-level need, then what will that do to carers that, are, that, 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 that need that assessment quickly? Uh, they are saying that there's scarce resources in terms of uh, getting access to social workers and ongoing and changing needs. How will that, you know, so in practice, I think, uh, we're, we're, we're searching for assurances that um, uh, a worthwhile measure will not impact uh, uh, on those who are in more urgent need of, 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 of care and providing that regular and ongoing care. Well, of course, it will be for each local authority to uh, manage the, the caseload, as it were, that comes forward. So um, how they uh, handle those that they deem uh, to be more urgent than others will be uh, a matter that could be uh, determined by the processes that are set out uh, uh, locally, uh, of course. But I would make the point that we have set out within the financial mem memorandum a substantial additional uh, resource uh, by 21-22. Uh, uh, financial year will be over £63 million uh, for uh, support uh, to carers, which is, uh, I think we would agree, a considerable sum. So we are uh, proposing to resource uh, this change in recognition that uh, a greater number of people over time, we think it will rise uh, over time, uh, will come forward. So I, I would hope that would take uh, care of uh, those concerns. We're going to resource this uh, properly, convener. It said there was another aspect of over time, wasn't it? They, mm -hmm. they, they also made the case that 
there's a likelihood that this, you know, by making this available, not just in uh, numbers, uh, people coming forward, that, that there are some examples in England where where it was it wasn't as slow. There was a a, a, a take up in the short term over you know a three year period. I think they argued that that um, you know there was a short term demand, not a long, not a slow build up, but a, a surge at the beginning. You know, so I don't know whether that's been taken care of. Well, of course, we'll assess uh, any evidence that's before us, and we've done that as part of the process. I know the other point has been made about uh, you know free personal care has been uh, offered as a comparison because the take up rate there uh, has been uh, higher. I don't uh, necessarily think that's comparing apples uh, with uh, apples because, of course, the uh, you would expect the take up rate for free personal care to be higher because. Um, most of the people entitled to it would already be known uh, to the uh, local uh, authority. We'll, of course, take on board any evidence before us, but I think there's plenty uh, of evidence uh, available at uh, to suggest that uh, the uh, take-up rate will uh, rise uh, on a, a steady but uh, incremental basis. One, one final question on the subject. If the sh surge happens in the short term, how would the Scottish Government cope with that? What would, what would be a reaction from the Scottish Government mm. if there was a surge uh, in, those, in, the, in, in those early days of weeks and months of the implementation? Mm -hmm. Because what we're dealing with here is sets of vulnerable people. Of course. We can't you know, necessarily deal with that in the rest of the spec. You know, it's done. So what, 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 what contingency is in place to ensure that if there is a surge, that that we're able to, 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 to respond to that? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we are in uh, dialogue with uh, COSLA and we've uh, uh, set up a, a finance group to look at the uh, in further detail because we are recognise, and you've alluded to yourself to the uh, concerns that we expressed about COSLA in terms of uh, the resourcing of the bill. I should say we have offered uh, to them to provide any evidence that they have uh, about uh, a different forecast um, which they haven't provided uh, thus far, but we've set up uh, a finance group to look at these matters in greater detail. COSLA will be represented on that group, so we will uh, continue to explore these matters uh, in detail uh, with them. I, I suppose the point I would make is, and uh, you know, you've talked of a, a surge uh, uh, in uh, England. I'm not convinced there has been anything that you could describe as a, a surge uh, per se. Certainly, officials are in dialogue with colleagues down south and. Uh, they aren't talking of uh, a surge uh, per se, so uh, of course we will uh, continue to increase demand. You know, significant increase be a demand well, I in England. Invite, I can before maybe invite. That, maybe it's my uh, poor language, uh, but uh, you know, poor use of language. Uh, maybe it well, can be described as a surge. Uh, but what is it? What is the discussion? Well, what is the uh, the English experience? Uh, what what can we learn from that? And uh, does yeah. it affect our our thinking? Does uh, it? Well, I've no doubt there's been increased demand. We forecast increased demand through this bill as well. Whether or not, maybe it does come down to a matter of language convener, I wouldn't necessarily the, describe the, that Minister, as a, a I'm, surge. I'm, I'm trying to get the difference. I accept yeah. that you know, it's, it's, it's there, uh -huh. and about that increased demand over time. Yeah. So there's a, a difference. Is there? Is there a? I use the word surge. You yeah. Choose any word you like. Uh -huh. Well, I would describe it as increased demand. So. In the shorter term rather than yeah. the longer term. Does yeah. that give you any cause for concern at all, given the English experience? Well, I'll maybe invite Moira to say a little bit Thank more about uh, contact with uh, colleagues uh, down south, but I think the use of the term surge is probably uh, unhelpful. I'm not here to argue over words, Minister. I'm, there's, a, there's a point we made here about the, 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 the shorter term increase in demand. Uh, can, can you? Tell us about the English experience, whether it gives us concern or not. If it doesn't give us concern, I've got my answer. That's, that's fine. The English experience is, is that there's um, there's not been a, a surge in the first few months of operation of the of the Care Act down south. There's not been a surge, so there's no the, no. Cause are wrong. We've spoken to officials down south, and they've said there's not the demand that they thought might they might have anticipated hasn't emerged but it only is a few months of operation so um you know we so have to look at it again wrong to use that that short implementation as a part of their argument that's what we're saying we, we can discount that as a committee what 
oh, well, ultimately the committee will need to come to its own position, convener. I would say, say suggest that the use of the term surge it does not reflect reality. We are confident of the figures we have set out. I'm trying to get your view on causeless evidence that's been put to this committee. The people that you will put in charge of delivering this yes. policy. Yeah. Now, we have established, for, I don't know why it took us 10 minutes, but we have, we have established that we should not take into serious consideration the claim that Cosler made that there's a, an, an, a surge, an unpredicted demand in early implementation. It doesn't give us any room for worry. We can discount that when we're dealing with our report. Well... If you want to put it that way, convener, that's where you want to put it. The point I'm, I'm making is we are confident in the figures we have set out in the, the financial memorandum and the policy memorandum. We are confident of our methodology. We've invited uh, COSLA to provide us with theirs. They've not provided it thus far, but we will continue to work with COSLA. I think right. that's a, a reasonable position to yes, take. Yes, good. Thank you. Bob, and then Annette. I just, uh, then, th thanks, Commissioner. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to explore the idea of a surge any further, but I do want to mop up one or two other aspects of what very relevant points I thought the convener was making. The first one was he drew a comparison with with free personal care, which I thought was an interesting one. So in Glasgow, for example, there is a time period by which someone who would qualify for free personal care would wait to be assessed. And then once they've been assessed, there'd be a time period they'd have to wait before that package was delivered. That may already be the case for for carers who are getting assessments currently across local authorities. I'm not sure what the situation is across local authorities, but in terms of what a reasonable time period in waiting to be assessed would be, and a time period to have a package then delivered would be, I'm just wondering how much of that would be at complete local discretion. I would feel more comfortable, uh, not, the, not the government dictating what those time periods should be, but maybe giving some guidance by which local authorities should operate to in relation to carers' assessments. I think some information around that or some of your, your thoughts in relation to that would be quite helpful. Uh, I think that's probably the likely space we will o occupy with that, uh, Mr Doris. I mean, there are obviously uh, a spectrum of people involved uh, in caring responsibility with dealing with a, a spectrum of different uh, conditions. So there could be some circumstances I would accept where uh, the necessity for it being dealt with very urgently. I'm thinking of those who have uh, care and responsibilities for people who are maybe at the end of uh, their lives. There's maybe a greater need for it to be dealt with uh, on an expedited uh, basis uh, than there might be in other uh, particular uh, cases. Uh, there is nothing on the uh, face of the bill about timescales at this moment in time. We are obviously open uh, to, uh, I mean this is us just at the stage one of the process, we're open to hearing uh, arguments to as to why it should be the case that there are. I think it, they, it could potentially be particularly persuasive in the circumstances I've just uh, set out. Um, so that's something we can uh, deal with as we move forward into stage two. Just very briefly, just to follow up, because actually you, you perhaps gave more information than I thought you might g give there, Minister. I have to say, I, I, well, I like to be here. Was, 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 I'm not sure how I feel about the information you gave the Minister, but the more information you gave w w was interesting because obviously this committee is at the stage of what should or, should or shouldn't be on the stage of uh, on the face of the bill, but what I was considering was not about prioritised cases, but mm -hmm. just, if you like, the generic routine carers assessments yes. that would come forward and any gap between identifying someone needs an assessment, getting that assessment, identifying a package and delivering that package. Because that happens in other aspects of local authority right. delivery at the moment. So some guidance on that, I think, from the government, whether on the face of the bill or whatever, let's uh -huh. deal with that later, I think would be helpful. But uh -huh. you did then move on to my second point, which I think the convener made quite well, which was about um, some carers who are already in the system and getting a, not a superb service, mm -hmm. but I suppose everything's relative, getting a reasonable service from local authorities um, and their concerns that that might be diminished somehow. And I'm sure that won't be for, in their case, but I'm thinking about new carers coming into the system mm -hmm. who should get priority. Would any mm -hmm. guidance given to local authorities make sure there's a kind of fast-tracking process in relation to that via social work departments or whether it's integrated mm -hmm. health and social care boards. So there's just to, to, to finesse it slightly, there's two aspects there. There's the routine mm -hmm. carers assessment, which will take place universally now, and making sure that there's no gatekeeping and delaying that process unduly and can that be dealt with in regulation, but also dealing with in regulation the need to prioritise. So 
I, I don't know if you want to comment further on that, but I just wanted to be clear, I saw those as two separate things, Minister. Mm -hmm. No, I suppose that's the part I was trying to make, I think, in your initial question, Mr Doris, you were suggesting it could be dealt with in guidance. I suppose that's what I was saying, is that's the, the sort of space we're occupying right now. Now, that's not been written, it's not been bottomed out, and I'll be very happy to take on board any perspective that the committee has. Equally, if it emerges that this is something that should be put in the face of the bill, then I'm, I'm open to hearing that case as well. I mean, we're just at the, the start of the process. I'm not going to take a, an overly prescriptive approach. I want this to do what I think is the most effective uh, thing to support uh, carers, so I'm, I'm open to hearing the case. I suppose the point I was making is I was just uh, offering a particular uh, subset of carers where I can see the, there might be a particular need uh, for uh, the process to be uh, expedited, those uh, providing palliative care at the, the end of life to the uh, uh, care for uh, person. Thank you. I've got a supplementary from uh, Richard Lowe before. You had a new question, Annette. And I th did you have a new question? Right, I've, got, right, I've got a number of supplementaries then, not new questions. And uh, Richard Lyle okay. and then, then, um, then Annette. Minister, you said that the Finance Lloyd Group has been established. Who's a member of that group? Uh, we've when, invited... When, when, sorry, if you like sorry, big pardon. Uh, and when do you expect it to report? Okay, we've uh, invited a number uh, of <coughs> organisations to that uh, uh, group, uh, Mr. Uh, Lyle, let me just get that in front of me uh, just now. But uh, COSLA have been uh, uh, invited to send uh, two representatives. When I was uh, at the uh, Finance Committee, they asked me, uh, had COSLA at that stage responded positively to the invitation? They hadn't at that stage. I can now confirm that they have uh, said they will participate. But other uh, members uh, from the Scottish Government will be uh, the Deputy Director of Finance, Health and Wellbeing, the Head of Internal Perform uh, Financial Performance, Team Leader, Local Government Finance, Deputy Director, Care Support and Rights Division, uh, Team Leader, Carers Policy, uh, two representatives from Analytical Services. Because we'll have two representatives, Social Work Scotland will have a representative. There'll be uh, three policy reps from uh, representatives from councils, uh, two directors of finance from local authorities. Uh, the, there'll be one representative from an NHS board. And crucially, of course, national care organisations will have two uh, representatives uh, on uh, that uh, body uh, as well. In terms of their uh, time scale, we want uh, them to uh, meet uh, as uh, soon as uh, possible and uh, report to me as soon as possible as well. Uh, uh, and just the last point, the co so uh, COSLA continually, continually um, say that the Scottish Government don't fully fund laws that they pass or bills that they pass. So what if uh, COSLA comes back to your uh, local authority and come back, comes back and says, we've spent more than what you're giving us? What, what's your view? Well, um, I suppose at this stage we are at the uh, process of trying to bottom out any concerns that uh, COSLA have. That's why the group has been established in part. Uh, that's why the group has been established, I should uh, say. I've made the point, I made the point to the convener. We invited them to provide us with uh, an alternative figure, alternative methodology. That's not been forthcoming uh, thus far. I'd be very willing to uh, receive that from Coslin for uh, my officials to have a look at it. Thank you. Annette. Thank you. Um, it's just that my the minister did touch on my substantive question in his reply to, to Bob Doris, which was, was about uh, carers for people with um, in, in, well, terminal, terminal care, basically, um, who I mean, clearly, I think, do need to be identified. They need to be identified, because a lot of them don't regard themselves as carers in the first place, because they're just you know, husbands, wives, or whatever. Uh, they need to be identified quickly, and they also need to have their, their care plan reviewed quite quickly, quite frequently as well, because circumstances may change um, regularly, well, fairly significantly as, as time moves on. And, I mean... I, have had, the Minister won't be surprised, I've been speaking to Marie Curie about some of this because I've raised, raised this before. And they feel that the care, the, a care support plan for uh, these carers should be in place within seven days of them being identified as carers and, and then reviewed regularly, as I've said. Um, they also feel that where the policy memorandum stipulates local authorities must set out their plans for identifying carers um, in the context of the carer strategy, 
they think this could be strengthened if, if in the bill or, or guidance. Um, GPs were included, and primary care was included, because an awful lot of these people will actually come forward via their their GPs and primary care team, um, rather than the necessarily the local authorities. And the final thing in that context is the need for um, short breaks for, for respite, um, and whether the local authority has been in a position to offer them that. And you know whether these are things that can be included either in the bill or in guidance. Um, I'd like to kind of have that on record and hope that consideration will be taken of them. Well, obviously, I've, I've uh, touched on that issue with uh, Mr. Doris. I recognise it as an important uh, one. Um, we uh, are committed to uh, looking at uh, the provisions that might be in the bill, in particular relation to those who are uh, caring for those at the end of life. I think the, the point that they will need a passport if it's identified that they need one. Uh, they'll need that pretty quickly, is well made. I think also the point that it may need to be reviewed uh, fairly regularly, uh, almost on an ongoing basis, is, is well made. And um, We are happy to uh, hear any concerns that might be expressed by Marie Curie or any other uh, organisation about how we can get this right, because at the end of the day that's what I want to do through this uh, bill uh, process and it, it's something we'll continue to look at. So I don't think we're a million miles uh, apart in relation to uh, that issue uh, uh, at all. Uh, in terms of uh, the issue about um, carers not self-identifying uh, as carers, I, I recognise that, um, uh, that is a challenge um, because people may, may don't uh, always think of themselves as such. Um, I think you made the point they'll think of themselves as par uh, parents or uh, the children of the person they're, they're caring for, depending on their uh, circumstances. We uh, do recognise it's uh, important to try and encourage uh, carers to come forward to seek assistance. That's why we're trying to uh, widen the scope of people who can be eligible for the assessment uh, process. I'm not convinced that it's uh, necessarily the case that we have to do anything on a legislative basis to uh, improve uh, carer identification, but again, I'm very open to hearing uh, any perspective uh, that should uh, be uh, uh, set out by this committee, by the members of this committee, as we uh, move forward in assessing uh, the provisions of this bill. In terms of um, uh, short breaks, it is, of course, uh, the case that uh, there uh, uh, is um, a scope within uh, the uh, the uh, uh, bill um, uh, related to short breaks. The bill contains uh, three uh, specific uh, provisions uh, regarding short breaks. Uh, the first is that there's a duty on local authorities, so in determining which support to provide carers, they must consider in particular whether the support should take uh, the form of a break from caring. Uh, there is a duty on local authorities to prepare and publish short breaks, the services statement, and provision that the adult care support plan and young care uh, statement must uh, contain information about whether support should be provided in the form of a break from caring. So uh, the, uh, this is part of uh, the process uh, as set out in the face of the bill. Rose, 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 Rose. Um, ask a few more questions about costs and um, one of the things we got in evidence um, from the councils was the cost of making up the support plan and um, they had carried out calculations themselves but the amount of money included in the financial memorandum appeared to be a maximum of, um, of what they thought was the medium range of cost for preparation of a support plan um, there's also concerns about the cost of a short break, and it might be useful to put on record what you see as consisting of a short break, because I think you're at the cross-party group where um, carers were saying it would cost, cost over £1,000 just to replace them, to allow them to have a short break for the space of a week. Um, that is a sum that's vastly more than what is identified in the the financial memorandum. So I'm wondering how those two things, those are things where we've had specific evidence on um, costs that aren't reflected in the financial memorandum. Well, what I would say uh, in relation to that, in terms of, again, I'm aware that uh, COSLA have expressed concerns about the the, the unit costs of um, the Outcare Support Plan and the Young Carers Statement. I should say the method of 
establishing the unit cost was very much steered by uh, uh, Cosler. They were um, concerned about league tables of unit costs appearing they wanted instead to ask local authorities for the total number of carers' assessments carried out in a year and the total cost in a year and then for uh, Scottish Government officials to work out unit, unit costs, which uh, they have uh, done. It was Cosler that wanted the average unit cost worked out and uh, not the median. Again, that, was, that wasn't a particular... Uh, problem from our uh, perspective, the uh, 176 beg your pardon, uh, uh, pounds uh, unit cost for the adult care support plan is the average based on questionnaire returns from 14 uh, local uh, authorities uh, and I think it compares very favourably with the median unit cost of £116 in, uh, in uh, England um, and uh, you know it's a similar uh, picture in terms of the unit cost of the young a carer's uh, a statement. Um, in terms of the uh, issue of the, the, the unit cost of uh, support um, uh, related to uh, short breaks, I mean, we are taking short breaks uh, seriously. We include within uh, the uh, financial memorandum a short breaks enhancement of £2.36 million pounds per year because we recognise the importance of uh, short it breaks. Um, we also uh, committed, uh, in terms of the uh, financial memorandum, the spending review uh, permitting uh, the, to continue the, the short breaks uh, fund uh, as well. So it's something that we do take uh, seriously, convening we provide uh, substantial financial resource for. So, so are you saying the short breaks are dependent on the amount of money that's in the fund rather than an entitlement for each carer to a short break? No, I'm saying uh, that's what we're providing towards it. Of course, it's to be person-centred and based on uh, the assessed needs of uh, the individual care that comes forward seeking that assistance and making the point that we are uh, providing uh, a substantial amount of resource towards uh, that particular area. Though. So if the cost is greater, as, as carers themselves are telling us, it's greater than allowed for in the financial memorandum, will that cost fall on councils or will the Scottish Government top up that fund? Well, of course, I mean, I'll go back to the, the uh, finance group that we've established. These are matters that we will continue uh, to discuss with uh, uh, COSLA. Uh, our perspective is that we have uh, provided in uh, the uh, financial memorandum set out that we will provide uh, a substantial uh, amount towards the support um, of uh, short breaks. I think £2.36 million per year uh, could uh, fairly be described as substantial. There is also the the short breaks carers fund, which, which we also want to continue as well. Will the government fully form the fully fund the costs of the bill? I think that's a question that really we need. Yes, there are provisions made financially, but it's not clear whether the cost of this bill will fall on local authorities or whether it will be fully funded by the Scottish government. We are funding the provisions of this uh, bill. We've set that out in the financial memorandum. The financial memorandum sets out how we will fund the provisions of this bill. And if there's additional costs that the financial memorandum has got wrong, you will fully fund that as well? Well, we will continue to maintain dialogue with uh, local authorities. We have to fund local authorities on uh, an annual basis through the budget settlement, so there will always be that process of dialogue with uh, local authorities as part of uh, setting any uh, Scottish Government budget. So you're not going to guarantee fully funding the cost of the bill? Well, I think when I say that we uh, fund uh, local authorities on an annual basis and we uh, have that dialogue and discussion with local government around each uh, budget settlement, that's, uh, that is us committing to uh, funding any uh, provisions that we legislate for. I, I, th I think that's where councils are concerned, because they feel that the cost of the bill will be greater than those estimated by the government. Mm. And if that comes out of their existing resources, which are declining, it means that the services they provide to, to other people, indeed the cared for people themselves, may be put on hold because they are obliged to fund the carer support primarily. I've made the point a couple of times now, Ms Grant, that you know, I've, we have offered to COSLA to bring forward uh, an alternative. They want to make an alternative estimate and bring forward their methodology as to how they came to that uh, estimate. We will uh, receive that and we will analyse it. We've not received that. You fund it, I think, is the question. Well, we would. We, I think the first point is we would like to receive it and see what it is. We've not seen it thus far. 
some of the, the issues. Dennis, I'm aware that you're still getting that supplementary, but uh, Bob's one of the, you know, just ask uh, for the seat, for the clarity on the, the, the short break. Yeah, and I'll, I will really try and be brief. Kimira, as I was listening to the dialogue between Ms Grant and Mr Hepburn, I was getting almost a disconnect in, in relation to what, what, what has been discussed. Like, I think we have to define what a short break is and whether it's for the individual whether it's the local authority or whether it's national criteria, and we're back to that again. Some of the people I spoke to, people in this committee spoke to, a short break for some people would be an evening off to go to the cinema with friends to continue to be a, a young adult doing what young adults do. Uh, for other people, it may be a, a week away. Some local authorities will invest significantly in short breaks, and other local authorities, what looks like a short break may be a, be a little bit different. I'm not sure how any group can resource fully short breaks if it's based on what individual circumstances are or the individual strategy by each individual local authority or indeed what is defined as a short break under the terms of this bill hopefully soon, soon to be enacted. So I think there's a disconnect in relation to how you can actually ever cost short breaks I think it might. I appreciate the minister's views on this. I wonder if it's more about the council, councils, local authorities having strategies towards extending short breaks to those most in need, and then that would be based on the individual circumstances. So, the definition of a small break, short break, I, in there, I, I think, is quite important. important. Can I add th this point, point just to see if we can get clarity on the minister mentioned a number of duties that would be placed on uh, local authorities to consider and whatever, whatever. But from the Cairn organisations, they, exp they expressed a disappointment, I think it's going back to uh, Rosa's point, about the absence of a right or an entitlement to a short break, which you've fallen short of. Is that, is that, is that correct? I've not, yeah, there's no, you know, we're not placing a, a duty on local authorities that they have to provide a short break. Bill, at this stage, that's correct. It can be that it's not that they have to provide a short break. They have to, and I can go over in detail again if you want me to, they have to ensure as part of any assessment of the individual needs of an individual carer uh, whether or not a short break should be part uh, of uh, the package of support. And I think that gets to the heart of the point that Mr Doris has made. It's become yeah. very difficult for us to be overly prescriptive uh, and definitive as to what constitutes a short break because it could mean uh, very different things for uh, different individuals. And on that basis, that's why I think the approach that it should be led by the assessment uh, process. And let's remember also we're uh, removing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, regular and substantial a test. So now it could be, and rightly so, in my opinion, that someone who's providing one hour, two hours of care a week should still be entitled to that uh, assessment um, uh, 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 process. Uh, if, um, now that they're encompassed, I think it, it ever more speaks to the need to have uh, it being assessment-led as to uh, whether or not uh, a short break should be part of the, the particular uh, outcome of that assessment. Now, that said, of course, convener, and no, I made no, the point no. we are at the start of this yes, process yes, and have a yep. compelling case can be made that there should be a statutory right for all carers to a short break then, uh, and it's something that we can um, accommodate, then, of course, we'll look to do so. I should say that I'm aware that the uh, National Carers Organisations have uh, spoken to my officials about this and said they believe they've come up with um, some form of mechanism and I think they've undertaken to provide that to us, I don't think they've done so thus far, when they do we will of course take that uh, submission seriously Yep, um, I, I appreciate that answer uh, Dennis, now I know we're going away maybe a wee bit back uh, as a supplementary, a <laughs> one-off and then we're going it, to go to other uh, Thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll try and be very brief convener. it was back to uh, when Mr Doris was speaking to you Minister and we established that we can prioritise, obviously, for end of life. Uh, and I suspect that the referral route would probably come from a health profession um, for the end of life uh, and to provide the, the uh, support for the carer. My, I'm trying to, trying to understand how you then prioritise the sort of general aspect of, of how you prioritise uh, who gets the assessments and who's carrying out those assessments because you can't actually establish a priority until you've carried out the assessment 
I mean, this is one of the fundamental aspects of when you provide uh, care, that until you've actually gone in and carried out an assessment, you can't then, you can, it's only then you can establish the care plan. So how do you prioritise who's getting the assessments in the first place and by whom? Well, I suppose the, the point is that um, if you meet the... Uh, the criteria that you are a carer having removed the regular substantial uh, test, you're now uh, entitled to come forward and seek an assessment. Um, uh, I think the point that Mr Doris was making is, uh, and I recognise there is also an issue about how quickly that assessment should be uh, undertaken, um, but I think the point he was making was having been assessed, how quickly that package of support can be put in place. Now I it was merely making the observation that there could be, it could be felt there are uh, some particular circumstances where that's felt to be a particular uh, urgency. And I would recognise that any uh, carer who's come forward looking for uh, assistance will want it uh, and is assessed and uh, uh, the assessment leads to them being entitled to a certain uh, amount of support. Any carer uh, having gone through that process will want that to be put in place as quickly as is possible. I, don't think I think you're missing my point altogether. Okay, well, why don't you explain your point to me, uh, Mr Robertson? Let's see if I can get it. I shall endeavour to do my best, Minister. My point is that we cannot establish the amount of care that a, a person requires until we've carried out the assessment. So therefore, establishing the priority of who requires that assessment is actually very difficult for the providers. I'm only asking you, how do we then enable the providers to prioritise? Now, it could be that it's uh, about the referral, who makes the referral, whether it's the carers, but someone needs to be able to establish wh where the priority lies. And the end-of-life one is a fairly easy one, but in general terms, I'm just saying to you, you cannot establish what is required in terms of need until you've carried out the assessment. I accept that and I suppose the point I was making is uh, that uh, anyone who meets the broad criteria uh, as being a carer will be entitled to that assessment. Now in terms of the how they are uh, prioritised we obviously need to have a system that's finessed to deal with that. We're at the start of the this process here I'm open to uh, suggestions as to how we can do that on a most uh, effective basis. The point I was uh, making is that I think we want to ensure that it's as seamless and as uh, expedited a, a process for everyone uh, going through uh, that system. That's my uh, ambition, but recognising that there will be particular groups, and I've offered one uh, example, I'm willing to hear what other particular examples there might be of uh, groups of carers who should be expedited further. Thanks. Hopefully I understood your point. I think I think I think it is a you know is a you know is a one that raises itself in terms of priority, but it could also be another layer, another barrier. You know, you know, not just that contentious thing that we continually get in our casework and indeed from evidence about the assessment itself and whether they've been assessed properly, and then and then w when you get your assessment, it's another process, and um, you know it. Uh, it is, it is, it is uh, very challenging, but I think the broader point is that uh, has there been any discuss, discussion with other professional bodies about um, you know a, 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 um, a process of a, a assessment that would be standard across uh, across local authorities? We, we could easily presume that a person near death or you know with a cancer, but I can you know that. That's got its progressive natures uh, as well, building up to a, an urgent need at the end. But there's also the preventative approach to support carers who may not be dealing with someone at the end of life, but in an urgent situation where if they collapse, there are two people in the hospital. You know, I mean, how uh, how uh, how do you deal with this this whole issue about prioritisation? If you uh, you know with uh, limited resources, I suppose. What, what what other you know? Surely it's not going to be left to politicians. To no, no. I mean, to put not too fine a point, I would also hope that you know a degree of common sense would kick in. So, if someone's in the circumstances that you have set out, that someone's in hospital and they're, they've collapsed and the carers needing um, assessed uh, urgently, then that's something that can be uh, taken care of. I suppose the point I was making to 
Mr Robertson is that we've not necessarily been overly prescriptive about that. Uh, the issue of prioritisation at this stage, and I'm open to hearing what particular suggestions there may be. And now, um, I think it was uh, Nanette Milne that um, talked of uh, Marie Curie's uh, particular concerns. So we've uh, heard them. We've, we're committed to looking at the particular case they uh, are making and uh, and doing that. If there are other particular subsets of uh, the, uh, of carers who need to be particularly prioritised, and that's something we're happy to look at as we take the bill forward. So I presume there is, there is discussion with your officials and organisations of what a prioritisation well, I'm, I'm model happy to, would look like. Or is it, was, it, was it just something, was it just end of life as a casual comment this morning? Or a, no, no, a, I mean... It's, as an obvious one, uh, well, I, I suppose I would observe it probably does present itself as an obvious Right, uh, so it's uh, not group. based on any work that you've done? Um, well, it's based on the fact that there is, and we're aware of the uh, uh, groups out there having raised particular uh, issues, so we will respond to the issues they raise. I'm happy Which to uh, bring uh, Moira in on this as well. Um, we'll be meeting the National Carers Organisation soon, so this is an issue that we can discuss further with them. But um, looking at the impact of caring is important um, to help with the prioritisation once, once a carer has, has had an adult carer support plan, but we'll certainly pursue it further. Yeah. No, you know, just in the earlier stuff, because carers are, are worried about if people are having, you know, with not urgent, uh, the, you know, the universal right to a, a carer's assessment, at that urge, not, the non-urgent, then it raises this question about diversion of resources. And it's that context, I think, that people need to be reassured that... When it's urgent, as the minister says, it will be put in place. Common sense will prevail in 90% of cases, you know. And uh, you know, I think it's it's important that we that, 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 that we reflect some of the questions that's been put to us by the evidence that we've had. I suppose that's the the virtue of the the process that we have. Can you you're raising questions are raised with you, you're gathering evidence, and we will respond to the evidence uh, that you gather. You have my commitment that we will do that. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Is uh, um, one back in and Richard, I think, went back in. Rhoda, yeah. can I can I ask about um, a carer's right to refuse to care? Um, something that carers have raised with me that a carer's um, assessment is always carried out on the basis that the carer will care, and then assistance is put in um, for them to do that. Um, a number of carers have asked me about the assumption that is made that they will care. And this is um, particularly the case, for example, if it is um, a couple, uh, you know, someone is caring for a partner. If that relationship should end, um, there is no way out of that relationship for a carer because they cannot walk away. Um, so, albeit that the relationship is at an end and someone wants to make a new life elsewhere, they, it, it, it's it's assumed that they will continue to care. So I'm wondering, somewhere in the bill, should there be a right for the carer to decide whether they will care and, indeed, how much time they will give to caring? Well, I think the, the first point uh, I would uh, make in the face of the bill, um, the words are uh, able and willing uh, to care in relation to carers out there, those words are in the bill, so the fact that they are willing to care, it does it features part of the process. I think this is particularly an issue um, well maybe it's not particularly an issue but it's it could be an acute issue for young carers uh, the impact in their uh, life, so part of the young carers statement process will be particularly around uh, this issue about uh, whether or not it's appropriate for the uh, young carer to be uh, undertaking that caring responsibility or indeed whether they want to uh, continue that caring responsibility. So I, I, I don't think we want to be in the position of compelling people uh, to undertake caring responsibilities. They have to want to uh, maintain that caring responsibility. That's what this bill is uh, designed to, to do. It's designed to uh, support those who want to maintain uh, that caring responsibility but also have a, a life uh, beyond that caring responsibility. So a carer could say, I'm willing to, to care between the hours of, say, 6 and midnight. I need a night's sleep. I need to go out to work. And they could, as part of their carer's plan, say, that's what I'm willing to do. And then the local authority must provide the, the care 
out with those hours? Well, uh, I, the ambition here is to have a very person-centred focus. So I think by its very nature, it would be incumbent on uh, any local authority to respond and take very seriously the, the points that have been made about uh, the, uh, the particular circumstances of an individual uh, carer. So they have other uh, commitments, they have other uh, needs that have to be uh, met, that has to be part of the assessment process. But I think the bottom line, of course, is that we cannot uh, compel people to care for people. Mm. Uh, I don't think we would want to be doing that, would we? I think that happens now, mm. in all seriousness. Uh, um, I, think, I, I know it happens now. Um, I had a constituent who was sent home with someone who could no longer walk or talk in the middle of the night with a post-it with a name and phone number on it that might be able to help. Turned out that person couldn't help. Um, and the assumption was on discharge that that person was going to um, give up their life to care um, without any support or assessment. Which brings me on to discharge planning. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk about discharge planning, but I think the, I mean, it's very hard for me to speak about the particular circumstances you have uh, identified at the Ernest Grant. If you wanted to contact me about that particular case, I'd be happy to respond. But I think it, on the face of it, speaks to the the very need for this bill because that person didn't have any form of assessment, I think is the point that you are you're making. So I think that's a, a good case in point for the very need for this bill. And it leads on to discharge planning because this person was uh, discharged from hospital in the middle of the night without any reference to the support that would be available to them. Um, should there be a right in the bill for carers to be consulted on discharge to be given the support they need before someone is discharged from hospital? That was very obviously not the case here, but obviously not the case for many of the carers I'm speaking to. Well, I, I mean, I suppose uh, I would start with making the, the general point I made a few times to the convener just now. Would, um, we'll be happy to take on board any... Um, Suggested uh, alterations, amendment, <coughs> big pun, big pun, uh, amendments to uh, the bill uh, going uh, forward. Um, I, I know that um, some organisations which have provided evidence to this uh, committee have uh, stated they would like uh, the bill to include specific provisions covering the role of cares in the admission uh, and, of course, crucially, the uh, subsequent discharge of people they uh, care for. Um, and I guess um, my commitment is that we will take seriously any uh, suggestion that's made as we move into stage two. OK. Uh, Richard Lyle. Richard Convener. Um, earlier on, we went on about Cosla, and Cosla said they're not going to get enough money. There are a number of concerns um, in this bill. One of them is, to me, is waiving of charges. At present, regulations state that a local authority must waive charges for support services provided to carers under Section 3 of the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act 2013, which I believe this committee uh, passed and I sat on at that time. However, the bill would repeal this section and therefore services provided to carers under the bill could be subject to charges unless ministers regulate otherwise. Why would we need to do this? You know, at the end of the day, we are, um, you know, we made a promise to carers a number of years ago, and as far as I can see, looking at this, we're going back on that. There are concerns. Some organisations have expressed concern that this will mean that the commitment to waive charges would be reneged upon. Surely we won't do that. There's no plans to, to renege on any commitment. That's right. So made. why does that? Well, can you explain to me? why the bill would repeal the section and therefore services provided to carers under the bill would be subject to charges unless ministers regulate otherwise. Are you going to take that part out of the bill, which will give me and others the assurance that what you've just said is the case? Uh -huh. Well, uh, as the case, I'm not quite clear what part of the bill you're referring to, uh, Mr Lyle. But the point is um, that this uh, issue of uh, uh, waiving of charges is one that we are uh, presently uh, working with uh, local government colleagues uh, in relation to, but our uh, commitment is, as has been set out, we have no uh, plans to move away from that commitment. So there will be no charges at all? 
that is our commitment. Okay, well, that's good enough for me, Master. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Just um, very briefly, with your indulgence, Governor. Um, Minister, this, this might just be a, a slight, a slight flying ointment, and I may just not un understand the situation. In which case, you have my apologies in advance. But uh, if you imagine a local authority who wish to provide a subsidised service for carers or cared for people out with the assessed needs that are being met in a package. So, for example, if a local authority decides it wants to do some subsidised day trips out somewhere or whatever, separate from you know, the, any short break commitment or care package or whatever, and they wanted to say, you know, for £5 or whatever, you, you could have this subsidised activity that otherwise wouldn't exist. Would that be allowed under these circumstances? I think it happens just now. And again, I, maybe I'm just floating something here that I don't fully understand myself. I've just heard chat at local authority level about, you know, providing additional opportunities for for people at a subsidised rate and just making sure this waiving of charges wouldn't prevent that, for example? I think I'd need you to write to me in relation to that, okay. Mr Doris. That seems a very specific example. Yeah. Um, I certainly don't think we'd want to be doing anything that would uh, curb uh, activities and the support that's available uh, there. I'm not sure about the specific circumstance. I think I'd need to have you okay. written to me in relation to that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, I appreciate that. Thank you. No other comment. No, no. I mean, you, I, I, might, you might want to respond without to without without knowing the specific yeah. circumstances. I think uh, we'd just end up talking ourselves into a girdle. I think I'd much rather see what they were and see how it would uh, interact with the waving of waving of charges issue and respond in writing. Yeah, in reflection, I should have written to you because uh, I'm not fully sure of the specific example. I just kind of heard of it. I thought I'd take the opportunity, yeah. but I'll write to you in relation. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Dennis, very quick. Very quick. Uh, it was, it's really to do with the young carers because we mentioned that at the beginning, uh, convener. Yeah. Um, Minister, how do we identify some of our young carers? What process can we put in place? Are we looking at putting in information in the schools? I mean, the young carers suggested to us that maybe having some sort of uh, poster or whatever in the, the school nurse room or, or libraries or something, but we need a process to help young carers identify themselves and or to be identified by teachers, etc. What could you do to to uh, help that process? Yeah, I mean, I to recognise that this is uh, uh, an important uh, uh, area. I don't know that it's necessarily one that we need to legislate for within the scope of this bill. It strikes me as something that we should probably just be getting on well, with. In the bill we've got there about the provision of information services, etc. Indeed. So. Uh, yes, so the information services will exist. I suppose the point is you need to know, uh, identify, self-identify. And we know there is an issue with people not identifying themselves as uh, carers just through their own experience. We've touched on that uh, already. I suppose you'd need to be at that uh, stage before you could uh, go and access that information service. So uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, better uh, support uh, carer uh, identification, uh, I, I think we, it's something that we uh, just need to uh, get on with. There are obviously um, a variety of uh, national policy initiatives to help uh, support identification of carers by uh, professionals. There are other initiatives which support the uh, with the identification of carers. There's the so it's government's funding of uh, NHS education for Scotland and the Scottish Social Services Council and the uh, College uh, Development Network for uh, Workforce Development. But uh, if uh, good ideas are made and it's something that we can help uh, roll out, either by sharing best practice or if it requires uh, some other form of assistance, then I'm willing to hear it and we can, we can uh, take that forward. I think it was a, a, an important point that was made with the young carers and generally in terms of our engagement minister um, about the move maybe to local authorities providing that care, uh, that, that advice and uh, information rather than independent organisations. And I, I, I realise there are challenges within that. But last week it was interesting to note from young carers that it was the information they got and, and at different points in their caring role varied very widely. Uh, in terms of 
you know, some of them related to the, their own story. I mean, uh, carers for uh, two and more years before any help kicked in. Sometimes that came from uh, the, the school environment. Uh, uh, in other cases, it was a GP. And there just seems a real opportunity here uh, if, if, uh, if we, if, if we if, of course... Not everybody wants to know why they're caring and there's, there, there might be stigmatisation around some young people or other people through addiction or indeed mental health problems, unfortunately, carries that stigma. Uh, and uh, there just seems to be a, 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 an opportunity here to have a, a, you know, greater coordination around identifying uh, uh, and supporting uh, 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 carers and all their interactions. Uh, one of the places that hasn't been mentioned, of course, is the, work, the, 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 the workplace and businesses, which can be quite a dramatic uh, impact if you've got appropriate support there. But these were the type of issues that we're, that, that we're getting. Of course, taking the, the last point first, in terms of uh, workplace, the uh, Scottish Government has supported the Care a Positive Kite Mark uh, initiative, which uh, is designed to work with businesses to better support carers. We've had seen a number of uh, businesses uh, and the public sector bodies uh, get involved in that process, and that's something we are absolutely committed to and continuing to work with um, businesses across Scotland to encourage better take-up of uh, this scheme so that we uh, can uh, identify uh, those businesses as uh, the ones which are, are carer-friendly and support uh, carers who, who work for them. That's something that we are committed to, to doing. Can I, can I respond to the first point you made there, the convener, in terms of, I think you were speaking of the uh, the duty for uh, local authorities in this bill to provide uh, care information services and the concern that has been expressed about the impact that exists on uh, existing uh, services. I suppose uh, I would make uh, the point that um, we are uh, implementing here a, a statutory uh, duty uh, that every local authority should uh, provide uh, that care information service. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to provide that directly. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to provide it in-house. They can, of course, and there are many positive examples of the third sector providing uh, that type of services. Now, they can, of course, work with the third sector to provide uh, that service locally. And whilst I think... Um, and I know there has been a call from some uh, that we should be potentially be looking to amend the bill. And again, we'll, we'll hear any arguments made, but we should be looking to amend uh, the bill that reflects the existence of uh, third sector organisations in some parts of the country. I'm not convinced that we can necessarily put that in the face of the bill. I certainly think it would speak to a uh, common sense that where there's already a well-established local carers centre providing carers uh, information service that they local authority could discharge its statutory function through pre-existing services. Okay, I think I've one final question, I think. Richard Simpson. Yes, it's really from the point that Dennis Robertson was raising about <coughs> identification of young carers, which is a, a major difficulty. Uh, just two quick points on that. One is, can I invite the Minister to look at the DAISY system, which is being established for data collection in drugs and alcohol, to make sure that young carers are actually one of the data collection points there that the people do I try to identify when someone has a drug or alcohol problem as to whether there is also a young carer involved. And the second thing is to link the system to the named, named person uh, under GERFET uh, because, again, it should be the, person who, the named person who is supposed to be responsible for um, ensuring that children are adequately cared for or whatever. Uh, that without massive interference, nevertheless, the named person is another route by which young carers should really be being identified in a very clear way. Uh, taking the second point, sorry, I'll take the first point uh, first because um, I, I'll readily commit to, to doing that. I think it's a, a, a fair point well made and let me commit to uh, us looking at the, uh, the, that particular point that's been raised uh, by Dr uh, Simpson. Uh, turning to the uh, involvement of the named person, it's already the case that the bill uh, does well involve a uh, named person for young uh, carers uh, in terms of uh, it will be the case that uh, a named person has to uh, be informed in, uh, of the 
fact that the young person has a young carer's uh, statement and about its specific provisions so they can be involved in ensuring that that support is provided. There have been some concerns uh, incidentally raised about uh, that process and I'm willing to look at how we finesse that uh, if uh, need be. I don't want to do anything that would um, reduce the likelihood of a young carer uh, coming uh, forward for assistance, so if we need to finesse that provision, we will. I think the point you were making, Dr Simpson, is that there could be a role for uh, an aimed person making young carers that they are aware of who may not have yet received a young carer statement, uh, aware of uh, that provision, I suppose, by their very nature and uh, the fact that an aimed person or persons should be uh, involved in this process will make them more aware of that process, and I think uh, essentially that will happen, but if we need to look at any form of provision or guidance to make that uh, clearer again, I commit to us doing that. No further questions? Can I thank the Minister um, and his officials for the attendance this morning and the evidence provided. I'm going to suspend at this point where we set up the, the new panel for agenda item number four. Thank you. Uh, we, we now move to the agenda item number four, um, and this is consideration of a negative statutory instrument, name, namely the Health and Care Professionals Council Registration and Fees Amendment number two, Rules Order of Council 2015. 
SI 2015-13-37. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Uh, Dr Richard Simpson has lodged a motion S4M 13509 asking that the committee to uh, to annul the instrument Uh, and as a consequence we will hear evidence from uh, health and care professionals, uh, 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 council uh, and uh, unison, uh, followed by the Minister for Sport, Health and Improvement of Mental Health and his officials. And once we have had all of our questions answered, uh, we will uh, have a formal debate on the motion. Can I welcome this morning uh, to the committee, Mark Seal, Chief Executive and Register, uh, Health and Care Professionals Council, and Dave Watson, Scottish Organiser, Bargain and Campaigns, Unison. Uh, and I'll move directly to questions uh, to the witnesses uh, and, and invite uh, questions from members. Richard Simpson. Yes, um, I appreciate that the um, the rise has been forced on the council because of the uh, PSA, because of the, the government withdrawing funds from the PSA, and now there's a levy on all the subsidiary groups, GMC, NMC, and the rest, including your own organisation, Mr. Searle, uh, for that, uh, but but my understanding is that with 329,000 odd members or, or thereabouts, that this would have involved an increase of about three pounds in order to pay for that levy. Um, and if that's correct, then I fail to understand why, at a time of austerity and pay freeze, uh, we are being asked to give uh, to, to for our workers to actually increase the levy by roughly 12 percent across the board. So, would you like to tell us? how you came to that conclusion, what your reasons for it are, and at the same time indicate why this has come after a 5% increase in the previous year, which I understood was to last for two years at least. Um, A number of points. Firstly, the reason that we want to put the fees up is not just being driven by the PSA levy. Uh, We also need to ensure that we deliver our statutory uh, duties, which is to protect the public, and we want to make it remain efficient and effective regulator. The three areas that we are having to make investments and spend money on are, first of all, in our IT systems, uh, where we're putting a considerable amount of money to make sure that we remain an effective regulator. We also need to continue to put uh, increasing resources in the fitness to practice process, the disciplinary process. Uh, The uh, cases we're dealing with are the more of them and they're becoming more complex. And in addition, we have to fund the PSA levy. As an organization, we can't just put our fees up and the money comes in on day one. We have 16 professions and we renew them over a two year period. So if we were to put the fees up today, the last fee for the last registrant would increase in one year, 364 days. And therefore we need to put that money up to so we can pay for the costs of being a regulator. Um, We've always had the attitude that we should be, wherever possible, efficient and effective. And you'll see from our submissions, compared to the cost of the other regulators, we remain firmly at the bottom. We think that is very good. And we are acutely aware that many of the professionals that we regulate, they have no choice. They have to be on our register. We're acutely aware that we must be um, very um, careful in how we spend money and keep ourselves at the bottom of the cost compared to the other regulators. Well, I, 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 can I just correct one fact, and that is you aren't the lowest registered body. The lowest registered body is actually the Scottish body for the registration of social workers, which is not £80 or your proposed fee of £90, but is actually £30, and for some it is 20 or £15. So I question the efficiency of the organisation when it's actually going to be three times the cost for social workers in England to register than it is in Scotland. The other thing I would question is, can I, can I ask you, why on earth is the HCPC based in London? What possible reason is there for being in the most expensive centre in the UK? Why is it not based in Birmingham, Newcastle, Leeds, Sheffield, or even Edinburgh or Glasgow? I cannot see the reason for these organisations being based in London. So would you like to explain to me, in terms of your statement of efficiency going forward, why you haven't actually sought, because I know you're also seeking new premises for your fitness to practice, you've had promises reading your report, uh, but sorry, concerns reading your report about your current ability to provide 
proper facilities for your fitness to practice hearings, so you're expanding into other premises. Why on earth are you in London? Right, well, dealing with the first point, um, the nine regulators that uh, are UK-wide organisations, and the numbers I make in comparison to, who are under the auspices of the PSA, we are the lowest cost regulator of those nine organisations. Now, compared to other regulators in the rest of the UK, for example, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, those organisations are not independent. Uh, they are arm's length body. The roles of those organisations and the funding of them is entirely different. Um, and therefore, I think making comparisons between the regulator of social workers in Scotland as a similar organisation to the role of the regulators in the UK um, is, is not a reasonable comparison between those two. Indeed, when the General Social Care Council in England was the same structure as the one in Scotland, uh, and one of the reasons it was moved into us is that if it was purely funded by the registrants, unlike the Scottish system, the cost of the fees would have been in the region of 200 to 250 pounds, and that's why they were transferred over to the um, to the HCPC. So I think it's reasonable for me to compare ourselves against the other nine UK statute regulators, some of whose fees are up to £890 per year in comparison to our current £90. Now, in relation to where should the organisation be based, uh, the, sh the organisation should be based where I think the, it can uh, undertake in its function, and you could do that anywhere in the UK. However, we are based in Kennington. We're not based in central London. Uh, our premises are very modest compared to the other regulators, and in terms of the amount of money that, we've that we're going to spend on renting accommodation for our fitness to practice, we think it's entirely reasonable in terms of what we do. Many of our employees live in south London, which is... Uh, and they're not particularly well paid, I think it's quite reasonable to be based where we are in Kennington. It would certainly be cheaper than, let's say, being up in Edinburgh. And my last, my last question is, do you really feel comfortable about the fact that, that uh, the uh, senior management, including yourself, Mr. Sell, receives substantial increases in salaries at a time when your registrants have been completely frozen? Your own salary went up in the course of two years by uh, 17%. <clears throat> or £26,000, which is about the average income of your registrants. Do you really feel comfortable about the fact... I know it wasn't you decided that, it was the Remuneration Committee. You're not responsible for your own remuneration, mm -hmm. but a remuneration committee which increases the chief, salary, chief executive salary and the salary of five senior managers by one band, although we don't know how much in that band was increased, but it certainly went up by a £5,000 band... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, at a time when you are asking registrants to make a big increase and they've prepay been frozen, is this a reasonable, fair, just system uh, and an, in an organisation like this? Well, well, as you said, I think when you are raising questions about the, the rates of pay for an organisation like the HPC, uh, those questions should be addressed to the Remuneration Committee. It's very difficult for me as a chief executive to speak on behalf of the Remuneration Committee. But in the past, for example, when the, uh, during the financial crisis, um, I in fact decided it would be appropriate to forego my salary increase. I think that was an appropriate a number of years ago. I didn't think it was appropriate it should go. But as an organisation, I think we pay reasonable wages. I don't think that they are out of order in terms of running an organisation. But as I said, as you pointed out, those are questions should be addressed to the Rumination Committee of the organisation, not myself as the Chief Executive. We won't get into debate on, 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 the, on pay, pay levels. I mean, at 175,000, um, you know, there are lots of organisations with pay salaries of that level well beyond what the Prime Minister or First Minister receive. C can I ask a final question? And that is that the, the whole... Uh, uh, question of the consultation period which was very brief this time as opposed to being lengthy and then your decision came out within six days of of the consultation you know that frankly doesn't strike me as a period of either consultation or reflection on that two and a half thousand responses which was pretty good in a very short space of time there's a very short uh, reflection um, on the, on the issue now I appreciate but the reason is you want, you want to get this, uh, um, this SI through and make the increases from August in August this year. But, you know, t to do that doesn't sound to me like effective planning if you've known about your IT systems and you've seen the increases in fitness to practice cases and their complexity. That hasn't happened overnight. 
So I still do not understand why that process has been, in my view, extremely rushed. Right. Well, in fact, we were very disappointed by the incredibly low numbers, the low percentage of people responding to the consultation. Uh, we have over 330,000 registrants. We have hundreds of organisations who take a great deal of interest in how we operate as a regulator. So the very, very small numbers of uh, responses was very disappointing, particularly as we are asking questions, for example, whether currently uh, registrants, the professionals we regulate, pay on a six-monthly basis. We want to move to a system where they pay on a monthly basis and therefore spread the cost. So we were very disappointed with the low number that, that actually responded. Um, in terms of the issue about how do we uh, undertake the analysis of a consultation, what we do is we don't wait till the end of the consultation and then take all the results and start going through them. What we do is we have a well-tuned and very good system is that we start analysing the very first response that when it comes in. So that could be the, literally the day after the, the, the consultation starts. And as that information comes in, we update the analysis of the data. And therefore, by the time we are at the end of the period for the responses to come in, we're actually in a position to rapidly come to the conclusions of the consultation. We think that's a good and efficient way to run the analysis uh, of what we are doing. So we have no issue in terms of actually we can turn the result round, result round relatively quickly. In terms of the um, when we had to do the consultation, it's been partly driven by the, as I said, the three issues. But with the PSA, I will have to sign a cheque on the day one, that the, uh, on the 1st of August, that the PSA is going to be funded by the regulators. It's not going to be spread over a two-year period. So essentially that cash has to be given to the PSA on day one. We're an organisation that has relatively low reserves and against the other eight regulators, the UK eight regulators, we have very, very small reserves. And therefore the need to get that cash to the PSA is very pressing. We expect to make a, a, an operating loss of about 1 to 1.5 million pounds in the current financial year because of the PSA levy and because we charge our registrants over a two-year period. So I don't think it was rushed. I think the analysis is very good. And as I said, the response to the consultation was very disappointing in terms of the very small numbers. Well, can I just say the response was in a very brief time of six weeks, not six months. And in the last consultation, you only had about 600 responses. So I accept that the yeah. figures were low, but uh, this was over a six-week period instead of six months. It was over a time when there were three public holidays. There was an election on, which many of your registrants might well have been quite active in, in terms of, of campaigning, etc. So I, I don't really uh, accept uh, the point that you made. And, of course, the other thing is that you, in terms of an immediate payment of the cheque, I don't deny that you have to get the money in eventually over a period of time, but you did have a reserve of £3 million, and the cheque, presumably the PSA, is about £1 million. So putting that out now to get it back later would not have seemed unreasonable whilst allowing adequate time to consult. So I just, I'm afraid I just don't accept your point. Uh, so just a point of clarification. I, I, I don't understand this point you were making about the six months uh, the consultations we normally run are for 12, 12 weeks, but we are following government guidelines in terms of the length of consultations. I'm aware that M Mr Watson, given that run, uh, hasn't been able to get in, so I'm giving you that opportunity now, Mr Watson, and I've got a number of questions that, that uh, uh, from additional questions from the committee members. Okay. Th thanks, Convener. Perhaps I could I could deal with that with that batch of issues. Uh, I appreciate this is probably isn't the raciest title that uh, I've ever come in front of this committee to talk about, but it's uh, nonetheless uh, an important one because obviously it's uh, dealing with an increase in fees our members have no control over, uh, and obviously therefore looking to yourselves for the level of scrutiny. Um, uh, as has been pointed out, there's um, uh, there was a five percent increase, which was pretty significantly above inflation. We were led to believe that that was it. For for a couple of years and then got hit with this 12.5% increase. Uh, as has been pointed out, we felt the consultation was inadequate, six instead of 12 weeks during a period of election purda. The suspicion, I have to say, uh, from, from, from the survey we did of our own members was that this was done at a time when, uh, when it would be under the radar from at least UK uh, parliamentary, parliamentary scrutiny. And then the very seven days taken to consider the responses um, rather confirmed people's 
views. That may be uh, that may be unfortunate, but nonetheless, that's the way it looks to our members in the survey that we did. Um, we understand that uh, and have some sympathy uh, over the point about the PSA levy and the, and the UK government cut there. Um, as we pointed out, it is only three pounds of the ten pound increase. Uh, the other costs are on, on, are not entirely clear to us. There's certainly headings there, IT systems, accommodation, etc., but not the the detail there. And therefore, again, to our to our members in the survey, they felt this looked like an opportunity uh, to increase uh, costs, and there was using the PSA levy and the and the government as an opportunity. Um, certainly, in the latest account, the 2014 account, certainly there was a surplus, an operating surplus of 1.3 million pounds made by the HCPC, and the reserves have increased up to three million pounds. So, I think the other issue that concerned registrants in the survey we put out was that not all the um, they don't believe that all the costs and the working practices of this regulator have been fully fully examined. Uh, their concern is that there have been maybe unnecessary hearing costs, which is a very expensive part of what any regulator does. 22% of final hearings uh, have, been, have been regarded as not well founded. Uh, and there is an issue about whether better filtering um, or, or another deterrence and education measures might reduce those, those sorts of costs. There's also an issue, I think, about uh, there's at least considerations being given about bigger, uh, a bigger look at regulatory practice and whether there's a practice of maybe pulling some regulators together, some streamlining of costs, uh, and that opportunity perhaps ought to have been examined in more detail before whacking up the increase in costs on, on our members. Uh, and, of course, the, the issue here is that it's an absolute monopoly. Our members have no option but to pay, uh, and, um, and they've made that clear in their in their responses. UK and Scottish government pay policy is at best 1%, so these increases are way above any pay rises that members are getting. And there really hasn't been consideration of issues like part-time rates, for example, a lot of the groups here are part-timers, or a sliding scale even based on the ability to pay. I, I see the comparison with other groups. I think our members uh, in this group are very often not, not the highest paid members and comparisons with doctors and dentists um, uh, are perhaps not regarded as being particularly fair. If you're an operating department practitioner or a paramedic, uh, you're not really on those sorts of, those sort of wages and therefore um, would regard that as, as an unfortunate comparison, to put, to put it mildly. Thank you. I've got a question from Rhoda Grant, followed by Nanette. Thank you, Convener. Um, can, can I ask, um, first, can I refer members to my Register of Interests and my Unison member? Um, can I ask about cost savings and indeed reviews of costs? Um, Dave Watson mentioned a number of, thing, of things, um, IT systems, and indeed unwarranted investigations, which are really expensive. What work have you carried out to, to look at those to make sure that you are using members' money appropriately? I, I mean, I don't agree with the statement that there are unwarranted investigations. Um, we have very clear processes and standards of how we make investigations if there's a complaint against a registrant. Um, around about 50% of those uh, cases do have to go to a tribunal. Tribunals are very expensive, but we have to test the evidence. Often, uh, professionals won't engage with us until the tribunal. At that point, they, they, they explain very carefully what's gone wrong. Um, I think we are um, we have to do two things. We have to look after prote public protection, which is our single objective, but we also have to look after the human rights of registrants in terms of the processes we run. We're scrutinized by the courts, and you can again see the number of cases that get referred to the courts are very small. We're also scrutinized by the PSA. They look at every single decision we make in terms of fitness to practice. There's an annual report. We're measured against those standards. We're audited by the NAO. We have internal auditors. Uh, we have ISO standards. So as an organisation, A, we think, and I personally think it's absolutely important, we are scrutinised and we're checked. And I think that's done thoroughly. In terms of savings, uh, what I, I suppose I don't really understand the issue, because I think when you run an organisation, it's not as if you've got a sort of spare thing, collection of things over there, and if anybody asks you some questions, you can quickly come along and save money. We run an efficient and effective organisation on a daily basis. We don't have a hidden supply of things where we could cut back. So I, I don't think there's anything that we could make dr dramatic savings on in terms of what we do. 
I mean, going back to, to um, investigations and the like, giving your own answer there, 50% yeah. um, go to a, a tribunal. Um, of those, 22% um, are not well funded. So we're talking yeah. about 60% of the cases you're investigating and spending yeah. members' money on actually go nowhere at all. Surely there is something you could do about those to stop them com becoming um, formal complaints um, by working with people much earlier in the system, and that would save you a huge amount of money. I, I agree with you. We, are, um, as a regulator, um, not having inappropriate complaints uh, issues being raised by the regulator is incredibly important. And we have a range of actions that we're taking. One is we're doing research to find why uh, to, to try and discover a why do people make complaints, but also why do registrants get it wrong. What we really uh, are looking for is either uh, situations where we can go back to the universities and we can change the education of those professionals so they realise where things go wrong. We also are working with the professional bodies in terms of the information they supply their members. Again, most of the complaints we deal with and most of the, the disciplinary processes that we end up doing are not with professional competence. They're to do with things like conduct, behaviour, attitude. Um, and as a regulator, we want to minimise those complaints coming into the organisation where it's inappropriate for us to take action. So there's a huge amount of work that, can, that we can do and that we are attempting to resolve. But we and so the point you're making is we absolutely agree with it. And yeah. Mr. Watson. Thank you, Kim. The, um, uh, I mean, I think there have been clearly big increases in referrals, and in fairness, the HCPC is not, not, not unique, and it's one of our concerns that there's, it's not that there's suddenly growing bad practice out there in, the, uh, in these professions or, or, or in others, but there's almost a culture of almost routine referrals developing in, in some areas, and I mean, you can argue it's a sort of defensive practice by employers um, to, to do this. Um, I think the response from regulators needs to be a little bit more, more filtering, a bit more deterrence, a bit more more picking out really what does matter. I accept that's not always possible, uh, particularly when it's a question of uh, of individual capability, the, the, the a particular and individual registrants uh, practice. Obviously, I see my department a lot of the cases that that go, that go through um, down to our professional unit in, in London, and there are a, very, a wide variety. Some of which, quite rightly, go to well here. Other ones, frankly, you think, why on earth are be, this is is this being called to a, to a to a to a full to a full hearing? Uh, and on, on costs, etc. Uh, I mean, I've made, I've put the figures on, on surpluses, and uh, I'm sure Mark has said that uh, that might change uh, in the in, in the coming years. All I would say is that you know there aren't many Scottish public bodies that are increasing their reserves at the moment, uh, uh, and uh, have made any surpluses at all. And so I think really uh, we just ask for the standards that we would apply here in Scotland to uh, to apply to um, bodies at UK level where uh, our members are, are required to register. Dearest one. Uh, Could I, I respond to that? Um, yes, certainly. Sorry, um, a couple of things. We have the lowest reserves of, a, of any of the regulators um, in, in terms of not the, in, in terms of measurement of both amount, but also um, how long they would last. I think it's entirely prudent to have roughly about three months reserves, and that's what we currently have. The other thing is we do need to make surpluses because we're investing, we're making capital investments, and if you make a no surplus or no 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 profit, then we wouldn't have the cash resources to invest in the organisation. Again, a slightly different situation compared to government funding, which is done on, on a, a monthly basis. The last thing in terms of fitness practice, again, to emphasise, as a regulator, we have the smallest number of percentage of complaints coming into our registrants. I actually think that's a reflection, a reflection on the high level of professionalism in the groups that we regulate. OK, I've got, I think, three um, committee members who wish to ask questions. We've got the Minister back in at 11 o'clock, and, of course, we've got the debate itself to come. So, um, uh, my first is Nanette. I mean, I see it's, I can split this into two issues. There's clearly the obligation you have to the, the PSA and the other fundraising, for part of a better word. Um, is there any possibility, I think you're moving forward, of, of, sort of splitting this and you're going ahead with your obligation to pay the, what you're due to the PSA? And is there any other means at all that you can consider other, obviously, than government funding for funding some of your other um, desires. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, and um, 
and if, that, if that's the case, if it can be split, it, would there be merit in going out to further consultation, given you did have a very small response last time? I suspect you might have a bigger response, uh, you know, given what we've, we've heard more recently from your, your registrant people. Um, it's also my understanding that Westminster hasn't actually discussed this issue yet. And what would be the effect, essentially, if we were to annul this instrument today? And then it goes on to Westminster consultation. I mean, what, what's the sort of process after that? What, how would things be affected? I know it's a bit complicated, but if you could perhaps deal with that. To answer some of those questions, if I, if I miss, can you come back? Um, in terms of the process, I'm, I don't suspect I'm the best person to advise you on the process. But as I understand it, if the committee says uh, um, no, then it has to go to the floor of the parliament and you have to debate it on, on the floor yes, of the parliament. Um, and I believe this is new territory. I, as I understand it, nobody's ever voted against a, a statutory instrument. Now, in Westminster, in fact, uh, as I understand it, it's called, for some reason, it's called pray and statutory instruments are prayed against every now and then and then I believe the process is similar to here that it has to go to the committee the committee hears it and then there is a vote on it I can't unfortunately don't know what happens beyond that now in terms of funding um, why uh, we don't normally make comparisons against uh, other professional bodies such as the General Medical Council we do compare ourselves very closely to the Nursing and Midwifery Council um, again I'm sure there's others who are more familiar with rates of pay but we believe the nurses and midwives are probably similar in terms of, of spread in, the, in their fees. Now, with the, the Nursing Midwifery Council, it's currently £120, 30% higher than we are. And in addition, because it got itself into some financial difficulties, the Department of Health gave it a grant for, I believe, in the order of £22 million over the last few years to keep itself going. So in comparison, in, in terms of which organisation should we compare ourselves, I think the NMC is, is a good one to make comparisons. In theory, um, well, not in practice, in fact, the DH has made grants to other regulators in times of difficulties. Um, so that is a possibility. And again, in our legislation, the Scottish uh, Parliament could make a grant to us if it's all fit, fit. But again, that's never been used in the past. Um, the position is, I think, from us, is that we have got to continue to invest in fitness to practice. We've got to continue to deliver our statutory duties. And we would, we would argue that the, the, the £90, though it's, you know, we'd like to keep it lower, and that's what we need to continue to be an efficient and effective regulator. Did I answer all the questions or did well, I miss any? Sorry. More or less, but with, with regard to, to you know, the possibility of further consultation, I mean, would, would such a delay, what, what impact would delaying for further consultation um, have? Well, Currently, even with the, the, the increase, we are heading f t towards a, a million-plus loss um, if the proposals are turned down by the parliamentary process. The first thing we do is would actually go back to the Department of Health and ask for guidance from them on how we should proceed um, because, as you said, it's, it has not been debated in, in Westminster. And I'm not sure what the situation is if, if Edinburgh, Scotland says no and Westminster says yes. Um, but we would certainly go down to the Department of Health and see what our, our options are, which in the long term, or sorry, in the medium term, might mean another consultation. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to, uh, to go through the procedures of Westminster, which I'll say are, are, uh, are even beyond my, my legal brain. Um, but I can tell you that there is, uh, we, there is an, an early day motion that had been tabled uh, at, at Westminster that we encourage, and I'm pleased to say it's attracted cross-party support from Conservative, SNP and Labour, uh, and, uh, and I think the Liberal Democrat as well, M, uh, uh, MPs, um, recognising that this is something that they have a role to, to scrutinise these things because we have no control control over them. It's not like a pay negotiation. Uh, so that obviously we, we are very reliant on, on parliamentarians to do that scrutiny. I do think also I'd say that I, I have some sympathy about the PSA. I think, frankly, our registrants in our survey still ask the question, what is the function of this overview body, which seems to add a whole pile of costs uh, to the exercise, but doesn't actually seem to do very much. Um, so I think there, there, is, there is that concern. I wouldn't expect Martha to comment on that, but uh, certainly there are those extra, extra costs there. Uh, and I do think there is an issue about a wider review of regulation and, and some of the practices. You know, could we, you know, do we really have to have seven or eight different IT systems and all the rest of it to go with that? And is there not an issue here where a bit more, a bit more uh, streamlined it might actually save everybody a, a few pounds, which at the present moment in time they could well do with. Well, 
50 minute expression. Um, Bob Doris. Thanks, and, by Dennis. and I'm going to try and be brief because I know the Minister's come back in shortly. Can I actually uh, commend Richard Simpson for moving to all this? I should say at this stage, I'm not going to support Richard's move to all this, but I think he's shining a light on on, on something that needs greater scrutiny. I'd like maybe Mr. Serrell to put one or uh, Mr. Serrell to put one or two things on, on the record. Uh, I think that uh, in general, perhaps uh, the HCPC efficiency or otherwise needs to be greater scrutinised by all uh, parliaments uh, ac across the British Isles, would you be content, it's not for me to, to, to talk about our committee's work plan here at any point, but rather <coughs> than play it against Sam next year, uh, do you think there's a role for this parliament's committee to have an ongoing role in scrutinising how effective or efficient you are as a body? Yes, I, I think we should be scrutinised by as many organisations as possible. Uh, we're, we're an organisation that has some, some pretty decranian powers. We can you know, remove a job away from a professional. Um, as been pointed out, we are effectively a tax on people and in relation to the professions. We regulate some of those work earn relatively small amounts of money. So um, I think it would be good that, rather like the Westminster government, if the uh, committee wanted to invite us uh, and answer any questions, question or produce a report, I think that would be absolutely straightforward and a good idea. We are an important organisation and I think that's entirely reasonable. And, and can I also ask you, Mr. Seal, do, do you think that the, the, the poor response to the consultation in relation to increasing fees is partly also uh, the responsibility of the HCPC who should be more proactive <coughs> in engaging with, with uh, uh, members in the sector to encourage them to, to respond? Would that be a reasonable thing to say also? Yeah, I mean, in terms of engaging with registrants, we, we have two very different things and very different responses. In terms of, of consultations, um, it's always disappointing in the number of people that actually respond to you. But one of the things we do do, we've always thought it's very important as a regulator to actually meet the people that we regulate. <coughs> so what we've been doing for the last 15 years is up to eight times a year, we go to uh, various places throughout the UK. Uh, we meet uh, registrants. We have two sessions, one, in the, one just after lunch, one in the evening. Uh, and we sit down and talk to the people that we regulate. So we've just been to um, Middlesbrough a few weeks ago we'll be up in uh, the Highlands at, in, in October this year for a couple of meetings and we talk to registrants now what is of great interest to them is in fact not things like fees what they're particularly interested in things like continuing competence or continuing fitness to practice they're very interested in the um, sometimes very difficult environments they're now working with where the demands on their times it's always continuous pressure so those issues are the things that the registrants talk to us about rather than issues such as fees I mean, the reason, the, I mean, the reason I won't be supporting that element has nothing at all to do with, I think, the performance of the HCPC. It, yep. It's more to do with the fact that, uh, from the note I've got here, I want to make sure that the correct investment is made in improving the fitness to practice hearings and in IT systems. That, that's why I won't support yep. the annulment. And it's easy, I mean, I, I do know the, the increase of £10 in a year, something like three pence a day. And I don't make light of that, 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 that very small number. I don't make light of it. It's more about a pattern and a trend of increases. Um, so... What assurances can you give this committee going forward that this is a realignment, perhaps, that's been required, um, but is not an ongoing trend towards further and further chunkier increases? Because once people get a taste for double-digit increases, they might stick to it. So can you give this committee some assurances? OK, a, a couple of points. Again, can you come back if I haven't answered the question correctly? Um, just the first point I was going to make is that if you are going to invite organisations like myself to come to this committee, you might also want to consider inviting the PSA, the oversight organisation, for them to give you the view of how the regulators are doing. They produce an annual report. They also do reports on our fitness to practice process, and they would be a good organisation in terms of you getting an oversight of all the nine organisations which have UK responsibilities. In terms of the future, I'm absolutely committed to making sure that we remain the lowest cost regulator of those nine regulators, and we will do everything we can possibly do to make sure that we don't make any more significant increases. We try and keep ourselves as, as low as possible, but the reason I'm starting to, I don't want to sort of hedge the question. It's quite difficult for me to sort of say an absolute commitment. We're not going to put them up for two years because I don't know what's coming down the road, but we will absolutely make our best endeavours that we can to make sure that we do not put our fees up. Uh, for certainly the next couple of years. So uh, is, is, is that a reasonable enough commitment, or am I hedging well, well, my bets? Can I just say, um, yeah. 
that that will get you far enough this year. I think yeah. it'll, be a, it'll be a very very different conversation if I'm on this committee next year. If some of the semi reassurances, not full reassurances, yeah. don't 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 come into play, but um, yeah, it could be a very different conversation next year. Okay, I, I will so. do my utmost pass not to come, for, not for you to invite me back next year. Oh no, I think you've been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Watts. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I think um, we would welcome, obviously, for the reasons I've indicated, um, uh, a, a more in-depth look at the issue of, 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 of regulation and regulatory costs. I, th I think uh, that it's very clear from the, from I hope, from the submission we've made and the survey from our from our members that uh, they are at best confused as to why these increases are there. I think, you know, all we would I would say is that, you know, we when we had the big five percent increase, we were told, you know, that there wasn't a plan to review it now I accept you know events change um, but the the point is that the the event that changed was the the three pounds out of the ten pound the three the thirty percent the event presumably things like IT systems and accommodation are not dreamt up overnight uh, so what I'd say is that the, the subsequent increase of twelve and a half percent frankly doesn't match up with the with an argument that all oh, this has just been dropped on us in at the last five minutes and that's why in our survey uh, that we did have time to pull together amongst our members uh, that they felt there was an element of opportunism here that oh well we as we're doing the increase let's let's get all of this stuff under under the one the one heading so um i think that's why we feel that um that these increases are unreasonable at this time dennis we're now running behind but i'll yeah, we'll take one from you I'll, i will be brief convener I, I know that you've got uh, 16 uh, professions there's 330,000 members um, you give a 50% uh, reduction to new graduates for two years. Um, you're saying that uh, they can spread the cost of the fees uh, in a direct debit for every every six months. Um, my question is that why can't they have a monthly um, direct debit to spread the cost, which might make it easier for, for some? Why is there just a, a single flat fee? Because I suspect the salaries for the 16 different professions are very varied uh, across the board. Um, so there are some going to be actually lower paid than others, uh, and you've got a flat fee. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any way that you would consider looking at uh, uh, differentials within the fees according to salary and maybe this monthly direct debit. Um, on the direct debit, we consulted, in fact, on going to a, a monthly payment, uh, and that was very received, well received. Uh, and we are now, in fact, starting a large major IT pro uh, process, and our intention is to bring in monthly payments so that the individuals will be able to spread that out. So that project is now underway. In terms of whether we should have differential fees across the different professions, um, from day one, we very much uh, put the argument forward that we would have similar processes uh, and similar ways of regulating those individuals from whether you're a clinical scientist or an art therapist. Now from year to year the cost of the professions does change. You might get a particular profession that has a large number of complaints one year but not the next year. We think it is a fairer way to have a single cost for all the registrants across all the different professions. Um, there are examples uh, across the world where different regulators have a different attitude. The, the regulator in Australia, they are a multi-professional regulator in terms of the registration process, and they have different fees for different professions. And what happens is the very small professions end up with a significantly large registration fee compared to the big professions. So that's where they've done try to do it by profession. I think if we try to do it by the salary of the registrant, I suspect you could do it, but it would certainly be a huge challenge. And then what would happen if people went on part-time working or if people took uh, time off uh, for long holidays? I think it would just be incredibly complicated. So I think our system is pretty fair in terms of how we approach it. Just, just on that very point, uh, perhaps we can help uh, trade unions manage to do it with uh, with our subs. Uh, uh, we do it by salaries, and I don't think we're unique as far as organisations and uh, ability to pay. I think is a, an important principle. Okay. okay, you've had five, six questions. Do you need another one? Well, I just asked why no quality impact was done. There was no impact assessment. Um, we're not to required to do. Sorry, I, I, sorry. 
in, 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 in relation and to what? In relation to the effects of, of the, uh, when you did the consultation normally, yep. when you're proposing an SSI, you do an equality impact uh, assessment, and we're used to that in this parliament. There's none been done. Yeah. A lot of your registrants are women. A lot of them are part time. A lot of them are taking career breaks. Um, you know, I, I would have thought an equality impact assessment here was critical, even okay. as a matter of fairness, even if it's not a requirement by the government. Yeah, I, I, about 60% of our registrants are in fact f female, um, so it's, it's a, the significant majority. Um, we would expect the Department of Health to do the, 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 the review of the legislation rather than ourselves. <coughs> okay, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Minister's with us. Can I thank the witnesses for being here with us this morning and taking all of our questions? I'm going to go directly. I'm going to pause at all. I'm just going to set up the Minister and his team um, as we're running a wee bit behind. Um, thank you. Good. Can I welcome the, the Minister back to the meeting <coughs> um, and, and also extend a welcome to the officials accompanying the Minister, Fiona McQueen, Chief Nursing Officer, and Ailsa Garland, Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, and I believe the Minister wishes to make an opening uh, statement remarks. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Kevin. I'm just remembering to turn off my... Uh Blackberry here again. Advisable, yeah. Um, I, I don't particularly have uh, much to say in advance. Uh, can be, I'm happy to be here, and I think it's probably better just to take questions. Well, yeah, I appreciate that, but you will we'll proceed. Um, uh, uh, can Richard Simpson wishes to ask some questions? Uh, we heard in the first session about the fact that the Scottish system for registering social workers was not the same. Uh, that the powers and the and the requirements and the degree of independence were not the same. So, even so, you know, a, 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 a system which costs thirty pounds in Scotland and ninety pounds to social workers in England, that's quite a bit of difference. Uh, so, is, does the government subsidise the Scottish system, or is it run at a loss? Or, and and the fi figures for you know people like child support workers are, are considerably less. They're sort of ten or fifteen pounds. So but really quite low. So can, can I start by trying to clarify for the committee what the differences are between the, the registration process in Scotland for social workers and those in England? Okay, my, my understanding is we do not subsidise the uh, registration scheme here in Scotland, uh, Dr Simpson. Right, and the difference in function, because there are three times, you know, we were trying to determine how efficient the HCPC was this morning, um, and we got various answers. But, you know, here we are in Scotland, we're running this organisation for a third of the cost or even a fifth for some registrants. And indeed, a, a set of differential costs which are applied, obviously, according to the income of individuals. So child support workers are only paying, I think it's £15 now. So what's the difference in the process that HCPC provide to the country in terms of protection of the public that our process in Scotland doesn't provide or vice versa? Well, I can't speak to the uh, efficacy of the provisions for social workers in England, uh, per se, because obviously that's a matter uh, with uh, our uh, control. I'm uh, certainly uh, glad to hear your perspective in relation to the system we have for social workers here in Scotland. In terms of uh, the uh, fees that are set by uh, the HCPC, then uh, ultimately that is a matter for them as a body. They determine the fees they set. I think you know, that's not really my question. My question is, does the Scottish system of registration for social workers, does that registration body do something radically different to HCPC? I mean, do, does our registration process for social workers in Scotland protect the public in the same way as the HCPC does in England? And if they do the same functions, then, you know, that I'm not criticising the government here. I'm simply saying that, in fact, I'm praising the government. The government in Scotland are running a system through their agency which is a third of the price of, of, of similar workers in England. And the two bodies that are going to be charged, Scottish, I'll come to that in a minute, but the, the two categories of Scottish workers who are going to be charged £90 in England 
if they were registered with the Scottish registration process under a multi-agency uh, multi system, it, it would be considerably less. So I'm trying to understand why the difference in costs. Why, why do we run such an efficient organisation? Do we actually protect the public through our registration process? Yes, I believe we do. I think that's the, the bottom line. I don't think there should be any concern from the public about uh, their protection through the system we have for registering social workers here in Scotland. I think that would be the, the bottom uh, uh, line. Uh, incidentally, I'm not used to your praise, Dr Simpson, but we'll gladly take it. In terms of the, the specifics of your question, I might invite Fiona to say a few words. The, the ICCC, the, the regulation of, of social workers in Scotland is relatively new, so the Allied health professions, as 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 they're known, that the um, HPC regulate have been regulated for decades. So the regulation of the social work workforce, which is wider than registrants, the support workers are also regulated in terms of public protection. So it, it was created in Scotland and is, and is in relative terms a new air. So the gradual. Um, looking at fees and, and costing of fees is something that the C have been doing and they clearly believe that that's sufficient for regulation in Scotland. So they do the, pretty well the same functions as the HCPC. I think the HPC, because they regulate wider uh, than the, the the social workers and the Social Work Scotland Act um, has, there are, or the C. Um, make requirements on employers in terms of professional registration and professional conduct of social workers. So that there is an employer um, requirement to oversee the good character of social workers when they are then re-registering with the SSC. The HPC um, obviously regulates across the UK and has many professions to regulate and therefore does a wider, broader job than the, the SSC. OK, I mean, I think I've got that clear because it sounds like it's almost the same functions in respect of these two groups where I know that we're not responsible for social workers in England. Maybe some of the social workers in England would like to register with our body at a considerably less cost. Can I ask, uh, this was decided, I think, by the Privy Council, as I understand it, so we have representation on the Privy Council. So why did we not insist on an equality impact assessment? Because many of the workers engaged in this... Uh, in this, with this body, uh, this HPC, uh, I get the initials right, but they, uh, they, uh, 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 the register with this body are, are, are women, and many will take career breaks, and one of the things that's expensive is actually re-registering after a career break, which is a, is a significant barrier to people coming back, and we need them to come back into the profession. So although we're talking about an £80 rise to £90 for the general registration, we're talking about a £25 rise to £225 for the career break people. And yet no, no equality impact assessment was undertaken. And I wonder what representations the Scottish Government made when this was considered at the Privy Council. Um, yeah, sure. Actually, um, I'm, sorry, I'm not aware of, sort of representations that were made at the Privy Council, but in terms of preparing an impact assessment... Um, you can, the ex expansion memorandum prepared by Department of Health um, is with the papers for the meeting and that um, explains that the, the <coughs> changes that are considered to be outside um, the scope of better regulation sorry, um, and so they didn't, um, they didn't carry out um, a particular impact <coughs> assessment in the same way that they might have done for um, a statutory instrument that, that might have been prepared by Department of Health. Again, I think I understand that, but it doesn't alter the fact that particularly for career breaks, you know, there is a differentiation that it is mostly women who take career breaks. And therefore, there is an equality issue when you raise the fees of this. So I really don't understand why an impact study was not done. Can I ask just two further brief questions? One is, um, have the government consider transferring the remaining designated practitioners who are covered by this body to a, to a Scottish body so that all all practitioners, in fact, in Scotland, are in this group, are actually registered with the Scottish body, which appears to be far more efficient. And a subsidiary question to that is, has the Scottish Government considered, or did they consider, uh, uh, subsidising the, the PSA? Because the, the UK Government have made a decision not to subsidise the PSA anymore, and that's part of the reason for the increase in costs. Can I take you the last point you made about uh, career breaks? I think um, 
we are already helping uh, nurses re to return to practice, so we could do the same for HCPC uh, residents. That's something we're quite willing uh, to look at, so you have my commitment uh, to uh, uh, that, Dr Simpson. In terms of uh, your uh, substantial question about did the government consider uh, transferring the functions of those other than social workers to a Scottish-specific body, uh, under the Scotland Act 1998, we're not able to do that. It's reserved. So uh, I would, uh, of course, welcome uh, your support, Dr Simpson, for uh, enhanced powers for this parliament to potentially consider uh, such uh, a move. We cannot do that at this uh, moment time. It's uh, reserved. Now, we are committed to working with uh, the four administrations across uh, the United Kingdom to ensure we have the appropriate uh, regulatory framework. But if we wanted to take a different approach and... I'm not saying we definitely would, but if we wanted to, it would require uh, an amendment to the Scotland Act 1998, is my understanding. And the, the subsidy question? Well, again, this was something uh, that uh, was uh, agreed between uh, the uh, four uh, administrations. You will appreciate that um, the uh, public finances are uh, constrained. Um, it, we... Uh, did uh, support uh, the PSA uh, in the past. It's uh, an independent regulator, uh, of course, so uh, the, there is the need for it to be uh, independent of uh, government in, in that sense. So that has uh, helped uh, provoke uh, the change in uh, circumstances. So we are where we are. It's essentially been led across the UK. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, members? No other questions? We then move now to agenda item number five, which is the formal debate on the motion uh, uh, to and all. I invite Richard Simpson to move and speak to motion S four M one three five zero nine. Thank you, convener. Can I thank the the committee and the convener uh, for the opportunity to uh, debate this issue? I think, you know, we don't. This is, I think, in the. 13 years I've been in the Parliament, it's the first time I've considered moving an annulment to a, an SI. But I do feel that at a time of austerity, at a time when we've actually got zero inflation, uh, that uh, two increases in the space of two years is uh, not desirable. Uh, and when the first increase was 5%, which was a significant inflation-busting increase, although the sums are small, nevertheless, the principle is there that another increase of 12.5%, only part of which was actually forced by government action at Westminster, uh, seems to me to be completely unacceptable. And um, I, I have gone into the issues, I think, clearly, and I don't want to repeat them all, but I think you know, I have concerns about an organisation that pays its chief executive an additional £26,000, which is the average of the registrants that they look after, an increase in two years of 17%. There's far too much of this increases at that sort of a huge increase uh, in, in, when, when, the, when, the, when our workers in the NHS and the, and the care professions uh, have their pay frozen or an increase of 1%, uh, then that sort of increase seems to me to be uh, something which sticks in my craw, frankly. Uh, and it, five senior managers are also receiving increases, uh, which may have been somewhere between one and £5,000 a year also, uh, showed a general disregard for the current austerity situation. I think an organisation which has a reserve of £3 million did not need to rush this. It could have paid that £1 million up front and then recouped the money later. They did make a surplus last year, and therefore going forward, had this additional charge not been made, uh, they would have made, uh, we've heard from Mark Sell, the loss would have been about 300000 this year, and they do have reserves of £3 million. So uh, it wouldn't have been, uh, the, the additional charge of £1 million could have been met up front. I'm utterly appalled at the fact that there's no, in, no equality impact assessment on this. Uh, we, ha we have a situation where women will take, and men now, will take career breaks, but women particularly will take career breaks when they have a family, something which I think is entirely uh, justifiable for individuals to make that choice. And they're then faced with a charge of £200 to come back into a profession where they may well work part-time and be paid a very low wage. So I think that this is an unnecessary an unjustified increase. It should have been properly consulted on over a proper length of time, not six weeks, not a period which included three public holidays, which even shortened it further, uh, and at a time when the Westminster Parliament was in Perda. I very much welcome the fact that some SNP MPs have now signed 
the, the early day motion in, in, in Westminster. I welcome that and I welcome their support uh, and I move an annulment motion in my name. Thank you. Any members wishing to... I've got Mike uh, McKenzie uh, uh, and I see Bob Doris. Any other members wishing to participate in the debate? Nanette. Okay. Mike. Thank you. Convener, I'll try and be brief, but you probably know that um, my... Uh, working my brevity agenda is not uh, proceeding as quickly as I'd like, so if you feel that I'm speaking for too long, you could perhaps give me a, a signal. Um, I <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I was referring to the convener. Um, I had to do a bit of a double take when I was uh, looking at my papers this week. I initially thought this was a £10 a week rise, and I did a bit of a double take when I saw it was a £10 a year rise, and I'm, I don't make, I don't wish to make light of that because, of course, in these difficult times, we must all work, I think, to keep costs uh, and unanticipated costs down on behalf of everybody right across the country. However, as Mr Doris has already pointed out, this equates to something like uh, a bit less, I think, than three pence a day, 20 pence a week, and... Um, the, the, I, I think that is a cogent point in terms of the debate that we're having this morning. And just to put it in some perspective, um, for those of you that don't know, I represent the Highlands and Islands, and Rhoda Grant, who represents that region also, will recognise that um, many of our constituents are forced to use ferries in order to get to work. On Orkney, Shetland and Argyll and Butte, uh, the local authorities there run internal ferries where often people are paying £10 a day for a short journey of less than 10 minutes. And some of these people think that's a tax on employment. And I'm, I know that has nothing to do with the purposes of this committee, but nevertheless, I think it's an important point that's often not given the kind of recognition. Some of these people, again, just for the record, are on minimum wage. And we're also in an era where we're seeing welfare cuts, welfare cuts that you know, affect individuals in amounts that make this peel into insignificance by comparison. So although I do have sympathy, uh, my sympathy is tempered by that wider context and I think that the committee would be do well to dwell on the wider context as they consider Dr Simpson's motion. I think some interesting though and substantive points have been made in the course of our discussion. Um, I think the PSA levy undoubtedly bears some further scrutiny. I'm sure um, Mr Seale cannot have helped to be impressed at how finely, how finely the mill of the Scottish Parliament grinds. Um, I'm sure he didn't anticipate the detail and level of questioning, and I think it may be uh, uh, worthwhile for the committee to direct questioning at a future opportunity to the PSA in terms of its levy um, on the principle that it behoves all public bodies to operate in an efficient uh, manner which delivers best value. I think there's a further point that Dr Simpson raises about the Chief Executive's salary. It's not directly pertinent to this issue, or it's only tangentially uh, pertinent to this issue. But a 26k rise in these difficult times for any individual, especially one that's already highly paid, I don't think is acceptable in this climate. And I think Dr Simpson raises a further important point about the equality impact assessment. So... I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that Dr Simpson has uh, raised his motion um, because I think it's allowed us to have a, a, a discussion about these important points. But given the overall context, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to support it this morning. Bob Doris. Uh, I have to say, I, I actually commend uh, Mr. Uh, Mr McKenzie and his lack of brevity there because I, I now no longer have to refer to a number of points that I was going to make during... During my submission um, to this, I, I'll just stress again, not making light of the, the burden of, of employees, but putting perspective around three pence, less than three pence a day, does does have to factor into whether or not we annul this, the, 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 this, the, the, this uh, statute or not. And given the fact that there will be 
enhancement of the fitness to practice mm. methods and, and the IT systems, uh, I'm not minded to annul the statutory instrument today. However, uh, I would maybe uh, suggest to Mr Sell that um, just we, we don't necessarily get the answers we want isn't a reason for us not to invite him back. It's a reason to be invited back more frequently. I have to say, and I think the, the service that uh, Dr Simpson has done in the Parliament today is to shine a light on whether or not the HCPC is efficient or not. I have no idea if it's efficient or not, so we will have to scrutinise that in the future. Uh, I'm not sure what position this committee can or cannot play appropriately in relation to significant pay increases at the very top of that organisation. Um, but that is a light that we will perhaps shine in the future that may otherwise not have happened if it wasn't for Dr Simpson making this move to, to, to annul today. Uh, and I think the, the overarching point here is it's not about whether it's a three pence a day increase or not, it's about the trend and trajectory of potential increases going forward. And as I said during my questioning to the witnesses earlier, uh, organisations can get a taste for these increases. And I didn't quite get all the reassurances I was looking for in relation to that during that particular evidence session. So whilst uh, I commend Dr Simpson in bringing this to our attention today and making a lot of, quite frankly, very salient points, uh, I, I wouldn't be supporting the move to null, but I, I suspect this committee uh, will be looking at this again, not just this time next year, but well in advance of that to make sure that HCPC do actually do some of the things that we'd expect them to do. Nanette Miller. Thank you, Convener. I find myself very torn over, over the, this issue. I mean, I, I can see all sides of, of the argument, frankly. I, I do accept that there's an ob obligation to the, the PSA, which, which has to be dealt with. Um, I also do accept that, the, in relative terms, the, the um, HPCP um, fee is lower than some other regulatory bodies. Um, and... I respect their commitment. They have stated today that they will try and keep the fees as low as possible without further projected increases in the foreseeable future. Um, I would have liked to hear of any alternative means of, of raising money to fund their, I think, necessary IT systems and, and uh, accommodation problems. Um, I do welcome the fact that they, they have committed to making monthly payment of which, as you say, as Mike McKenzie said, in relatively in cash terms, is relatively small. In percentage terms, it's, it's, it's a big rise. So I do welcome the opportunity though, for monthly payment of that. And to my mind, that does actually will need efficient IT systems, which perhaps goes, takes me around in full cycle to accept that, that perhaps the fees should, should go up in order to accommodate the investment that's needed in infrastructure. Um, I do think there's a need to look at efficiencies, and I... I would like, in the future, I mean, I, I will not be a member of this committee next time because I'm retiring from Parliament, but I would like to see this sort of issue taken forward in, in future Parliaments and that this regulatory body and indeed others are looked at very carefully and, and scrutinised to make sure that they are indeed um, efficient and, and good value. I think I'm probably coming down on the side not to agree with an element of the, of the um, instrument. Um, I'm also interested that Westminster hasn't yet discussed this, and I'd be interested to hear how, how their discussion goes, which presume, presumably they will have um, in, in time to come. So I think I say, I'm sorry to be so torn. Sorry, but that's sorry. Just, that's just no, the way I I've tried to finish. reason things out. Thanks for that. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Um, just to speak in uh, support of uh, Richard Simpson's motion, I um, don't take an awful lot of comfort out of the reassurances that were given about no further large increases given we were given those previously and this increase is even larger than the last one. Um, Mike McKenzie talked about the costs to people working in rural areas and indeed mileage and petrol costs and that is a huge uh, burden on rural workers. This just adds to it um, and it may appear a small increase but given the costs that other people are bearing um, with pay freezes and increased costs and travel and the like, this just adds to it and I therefore want to support Richard's. Um, okay. uh, no, other, no other members? Can I ask the Minister to respond? Thank you. Uh, can, can I first of all uh, agree with uh, the expression that's been useful to have uh, this debate. I think um, it, is, uh, it has been uh, useful. I think it's very sensible for this committee. Of course, it's a matter for this uh, committee, if I'll be for me as a member of the government, to say uh, what the committee should do. But I think it's a very sensible suggestion that the committee should continue to look at 
uh, these uh, matters. I should say the uh, change here is, uh, of course, driven by factors beyond uh, the levy to PSA, but uh, taking that as a starting point, it should be pointed out this Parliament has already agreed uh, the changes uh, for the... Uh, the for funding the PSA and understand that the instrument which uh, set out those changes came before this uh, committee on the 23rd of uh, February. Um, but of course it's beyond uh, the, that particular issue. You know, the uh, HCPC uh, have a need to um, uh, upgrade uh, uh, their systems, put, make sure they're up to uh, speed to ensure they can properly uh, regulate the profession they have responsibility for. I am not unsympathetic to the concerns that have been expressed. How could anyone be? No one wants to have to pay more. I do think it is important to place the rise in some context, which both Mr Doris and Mr Mackenzie have sought to do. I know there was an exchange earlier, but by comparison to the other professional regulatory bodies, the HCPC, even with this increase, it comes at the bottom of the league significantly. Uh, so it has uh, by far and away uh, the lowest of uh, any fee of the UK uh, professional regulatory bodies. The increase uh, has been described as a 12.5% increase, which of course uh, I cannot say is incorrect, but in its proper context that is uh, £10 a year uh, less when you take into account the fact that you can uh, recoup th some through uh, your uh, tax uh, payments. So. Um, I think it is important to place it in that context. Also, there's been some discussion about uh, this uh, coming against the other context of uh, pay policy. I think it is important, of course, to recognise that not everyone regulated by this body is covered by public sector uh, pay policy. There are uh, some working in the uh, private uh, sector. But if you look at uh, Scottish uh, public sector uh, pay uh, policy, there have uh, been uh, increases uh, for... Uh, NHA staff have come under uh, agenda for change uh, in this, uh, uh, covered by this body, probably expecting to be in at least band four or probably more likely band five for both. Uh, last year and this year we've implemented the NHS peer review body recommendations for uh, an uplift at all uh, scale points whilst maintaining uh, progression and uh, for this year uh, band four staff uh, still to reach the top of the scale will have received an increase of about 4% ahead of the 1% that's been uh, referred to. The increase will, of course, more than uh, uh, make up for the increase for the, the levy that's being uh, put in place by the HCPC. We have had contact with them uh, as a body. They have set out uh, their uh, commitment to us as an administration that they want, and this has been referred to, that they want to move to a system of monthly payments, which I think will make it easier for those that uh, have to pay the levy and also there's a commitment not to uh, increase uh, the uh, fees again in the foreseeable uh, future, uh, which uh, I hear what's been said, which we have to of course take uh, at face value. I don't say we can operate on any other uh, fair basis. The impact uh, of uh, the annulment, if it was to be agreed by this committee, which I sincerely uh, hope it will uh, not be, would of course uh, be uh, to uh, impact on the HCPC's ability uh, to uh, regulate uh, the professions they have responsibility for. Uh, they would presumably uh, not be able to uh, undertake the upgrade of their systems that they want to undertake. Uh, and also, uh, my understanding is that without this uh, increase, there could be uh, uh, such an impact on their funds that they could uh, quickly end up in deficit. So that could, of course, impact on uh, the, the safety of the public, because ultimately that's what uh, regulation is all about, and on that basis, I would strongly urge the committee uh, to not annul uh, the order. Thank the minister. I invite Richard Sim Simpson to wind up. Pressure withdraw. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I entirely accept that the amounts involved are small, but I think it's a matter of principle. Uh, when you've had a pay freeze, admittedly mitigated by the Scottish government, unlike the Westminster government. Uh, for NHS staff, when those staff have had to pay significant increases in pension, and when they've been told that the 5% increase, which was above inflation two years ago, would be the last increase for two years, and hasn't yet been paid by some of those individuals, they haven't actually got through that cycle, and they're already back looking for a 12.5% increase, I think the, the, the sums involved are not the thing that matter. Although, having said that, 
when you've got a career break charges of £225 now, an increase of £25, which I think is a, is a significant sum when you're returning to work, uh, and you will probably be doing so part-time, many of them will, when the grandparent charges, grandparenting charges, uh, so one of those systems, are actually £440, and they've been increased significantly, uh, then I think the sums actually do begin, begin to matter. And mitigating it by direct debit monthly, of course, is welcome, but nevertheless uh, is, my, in my view, insufficient. We heard today in evidence, and I think it was a very useful evidence session, I thank colleagues for their ask, uh, questions they asked as well, but we heard that there is no attempt to relink this to income, and that is, uh, that is not... Uh, uh, in my view, appropriate, particularly when many of these workers will be part-time, um, that uh, we've heard uh, uh, what appears to be the case that the Scottish body is, ex is very much more efficient. And therefore, I, I really wonder what the PSA are doing in terms of, of supervising. They should be coming to our body in Scotland and say, you will clearly run a show which the public have confidence in, the government has confidence in, this parliament has got confidence in. It's a, a hugely more efficient than what's happening at a UK level. Uh, and, uh, you know, so why are the costs for the English body three times the level as proposed to that of the Scottish body? I think the final thing that really makes me move this motion was something that Mark Searle said this morning, and that is when he said we don't have any off-the-peg efficiency savings. Every single public body in this country, in Scotland, has had to make efficiency savings. They may have gone back to the body concerned and be improved, but to say we don't have efficiency savings that we can make, which is how I interpreted what he said, was, I think, a, a manifestation of an organisation that need, needs to be scrutinised very much more closely. So I welcome the fact that others, after I depart this Parliament next year, uh, will be, uh, because I won't be standing again, will, uh, will be scrutinising these bodies much more closely. But I want to move the annulment because I want to send a message out, uh, I want this Parliament to send a message out to our registrants, to the 329,000 registrants uh, across the UK and to the UK Parliament to say, this should have been far more closely scrutinised. The sums involved are not large for the PSA. They should have been paid by the government until there was adequate consultation time on this issue. And that has not been provided in this instance. And I think more time should have been given. And more costings should be provided. Not simply saying an IT system needs to be improved. I think that's not good enough. Or our... our, our um, Office costs, uh, you know, are going to expand because we need more room. I think these are, the costs were not provided adequately, and I'm not prepared to subscribe to an organisation uh, that actually doesn't lay out very clearly and in great detail its costs before that is done. So I move the motion in my name. I will press. Yeah, press the motion. Move the motion. The question is then that uh, motion S four M one three five zero nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed, so we move to a vote. Um, and all those in favour of the motion, please indicate by raising their hand. All those against the motion, please indicate. Thank you. Abstentions? The result, therefore, is for the motion, three. Against the motion... Five, with one, is, uh, one abstention. The motion is not agreed to. That concludes the parliamentary consideration of this instrument. Thank the Minister and uh, uh, his officials for being with us. Uh, we're moving uh, quickly. I hope we'll pause just a, just a wee bit. Uh, uh, but uh, we're moving quickly to our, uh, agenda item number six and just get our witnesses in place. Thank you. Aye.
I've got the net. to agenda item number uh, six, um, which is a final evidence session on smoking prohibition children in motor vehicles Scotland bill. Uh, can I welcome Jim Hume, MSP, member in charge of the bill, Louise Miller, uh, sen senior solicitor, office of the, the, the solicitor to the Scottish Parliament, and Stephen Fricker, assistant clerk to the non-governmental bills unit. Welcome to you all. Jim, uh, Jim you, you wish to make a, an opening statement? Yeah, yes, sir. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning to all, all of the committee. I'd like to thank everybody, of course, for inviting me to give evidence on my bill. Uh, I introduced this bill because I wanted to build on the successes of the Smoking, Health and Social Care Scotland Act 2005 which has been overwhelmingly successful in changing behaviour in Scotland and means that we all now benefit from a safer, cleaner environment at work or when eating out. The Scottish Government uh, has a stated aim of having a smoke-free country by 2034 and my bill focuses specifically on protection of children. Recent re research has shown that 22% of 13-year-olds and 15-year-olds in Scotland are often in regularly exposed or second-hand smoke uh, more than once a week while in a car. And as you've already heard during your evidence taken, there's no safe level of exposure to second-hand tobacco smoke. Second-hand smoke has uh, proven profound impacts on health and it particularly affects children because of their immature respiratory systems. Outcomes can include sudden infant death syndrome, coughing, wheezing, asthma, and respiratory tract infections such as pneumonia and bronchitis and, of course, an increased risk of lung cancer. And if that wasn't bad enough, it has been demonstrated that children exposed to secondhand smoke themselves are more likely to take up smoking themselves in later life. The concentration of secondhand smoke found in vehicles containing smokers is higher than would be found in the home or out of doors due to the very enclosed nature of the space. Opening the windows and air circulation may reduce concentrations to some small amount, but it does not make it safe. Most affected children have no other tra transport option or are too young to make other arrangements and are not empowered to change the behaviour of adults around them. So I believe we have a moral duty to protect those children from the immediate health impacts of secondhand smoke, give them the best start in life 
and support them to go on to lead healthy lives themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Our first question this morning is from the Net Miller. Good morning. Um, you'll probably be aware from last week's evidence session that I raised issues of enforcement. I mean, I absolutely agree that it's not desirable to have children particularly, anyone really, but children particularly in, in an atmosphere of smoke or, 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 or recent smoke. Um, but I think it was raised last week by people even who are in support of the bill that this is primarily an education issue to get people educated in the fact that it's just not the social thing to do or not the public, within the public health interest, this is not the thing to do to smoke around children in an enclosed space. Um, it's, it's really, I am concerned about how this can be enforced and how you can actually pick people up. As I said last week, I've got a tall grandson aged 15 who would be mistaken for an adult very easily um, in a car. How, how do you actually, how do you go about identifying it? Um, and if, if there is a sort of accusation that an adult's been smoking, um, how do you anticipate going about things? I mean, would you expect children in the car to give evidence, say, against their mum or dad if they happen to be smoking in the car? Can, can you just give me a little detail on how you actually see the practicalities of enforcement? I think, I think that's really important. Yes, yeah, so, uh, th thank you very mu uh, much, Jeanette, for the, that question. Um, enforcement, I think, uh, is if you look at the seatbelt laws and if you look at uh, mobile phone devices, we know in the last year, 2013 to 2014, Police Scotland detected over 36,000 seatbelt uh, offences and 34,000 mobile phone offences. That's 70,000 in all in one, one year. So detection uh, is, is very similar to that. That's actually seeing someone smoking. It's pretty obvious when somebody's smoking in a car. It's fairly obvious that if it's a younger child. Obviously, if it's a child who's uh, 17, then it can be, uh, can be more difficult, of course but um, not impossible, and as Police Scotland said last week in their evidence that, the, that they were quite uh, happy with uh, making the difference between a, a person who's under 18 and a person who's not, as they do uh, daily, as they said themselves, uh, when related to alcohol and uh, buying alcohol offences, uh, buying alcohol as a, as a junior. I mean, it, it strikes me it's probably easier in relation to, to seat belts and, and mobile phones, um, I mean, you can see if people are, are wearing seatbelts or not quite quite clearly. Um, and mobile phones, you, you could, if it came to it, have have a record of when a particular mobile phone call was, was made or when the phone was in action. So that, you know, if, if someone was being accused of, of being guilty in this uh, under this legislation, you could find some proof. I, I'm not just quite sure how you could actually prove in retrospect that someone was smoking when, when the car was stopped. Or whatever. I know there might be residual, there'd be residual particles, but can it be proved when those residual particles became available? Was that, you know, I mean, just very recently, or was it sometime past? Well, uh, no, it would be a active smoking. We're not talking about um, if there has been smoking in the car uh, previous to the, the child going into that. That would be difficult to enforce. But we're talking about when the, the police. Uh, notice somebody who's physically smoking in front of them, which is very similar to uh, a seatbelt. You can physically see if someone's not wearing a seatbelt in, fr in front of them, um, uh, so the police would be able to use their best judgment. I mean, someone put to me, uh, not altogether facetiously, that someone might be chewing the end of a pencil or sucking a lollipop and, and not actually smoking a cigarette. I, I, I think it's. Uh, you know. I, I, mean, I think we can trust the professional judgment of, of police to tell the difference between a, a lollipop and, uh, and the, the smoking of a cigarette. Do they discover e cigarettes as well? No. No. Okay. No. I'll leave it to that just now, I, mean, I might, might come back. Mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose it goes to the heart of the question about whether we need legislation if it's difficult to, to enforce. Uh, and I'm sure you read the, the, the evidence from Police Scotland last week. Um, if anything else, they've not they've not got a, a, you know an appetite to be enforcing this as the only enforcing body. Uh, they will not, by uh, the, their evidence last week, patrolling school gates or whatever uh, you know where there, there may be adults or people smoking, um, and they see it very much down the the, the pri priority. So I would also concede that most people are law abiding. Uh, and and, uh, and there's a strong message in that. But uh, if we've got a law that that's not going to be enforced effectively, then why why do we need the legislation? Well, 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 we've seen that um, 
smoking in cars is still happening. It's still very active, as, as we know. I mean, as I said, there's 22 percent of 13 and 15 year olds are exposed to smoke. We have figures uh, from a survey that 60,000 children every week are exposed to secondhand smoke in in cars. Um, but if you look at other areas, other other countries where the, they have uh, went forward with this, they've seen a marked uh, uh, difference uh, in Canada. I believe this. Uh, after the legislation, similar legislation was brought in there, there was a, a reduction of 33% uh, in, in all of children being exposed to secondhand smoke. So um, we've seen a change, as we have with the, the Smoking Act of 2005, where that's had a knock-on effect into people's homes. I, I would expect that this would have a knock-on effect into other people's uh, areas of life without actually needing the enforcement. By, by, and all, by and by, most people are, as you say, law-abiding, so we're talking about changing the norms of behaviour. Mm -hmm. did you, you, did, have you anything to say in response to the, 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 the police evidence last week where, where they were saying that it shouldn't just simply be up to the police to enforce this? Yeah, well, uh, they very much talked about using a partnership uh, approach. Now, my, in my initial uh, bill uh, stated it would be the police. Obviously, uh, it would be difficult to see how local authorities would be able to stop moving vehicle vehicles, but I, was, I would be quite open to amendments would, which would allow a, a widening of enforcement if uh, local authorities were able to enforce maybe statutory vehicles. Uh, they also highlighted the potential co consequences of the legislation, eh, that, that's um, brought it for a parent or a guardian of a person under 18 and perhaps envisaged in the bill. Following the detection of offence and envisaged the outcome would also include the raising of a child concern forum which would be shared with the named person. Um, it, it is suggested that this approach would support the Gretna Right for Every Child principles uh, and Young Person Scotland Act. Um, is that something you envisage? That you, you, do you, do you well, I mean, the, 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 uh, you know, the named person would become involved. That there be a child, you know, a child uh, concern forum would be completed if a parent was smoking in a car with a child. Is that something? Well, that the, the police and, and the uh, health health enforcement agencies also stated that they didn't think think that would be a, a huge issue. It may be an issue, but that's the same as go, goes for any uh, child protection issue. And this is about protecting doesn't, children. It doesn't, I asked them last week if, if their parents get caught speeding in the car with children in the back, there's no child report for them. I, I would have thought that was pretty dangerous myself. But well, anyway, we're in the no, interest in territory yeah, and all of that. I, 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 so we've I, got, we've got, I've got uh, Richard Lyle, and then I've got Dennis, and then I've got Mike, and then I saw Rhoda's hand up there as well. Did I see Richard? Morning, Morning Mr Hume. Um, Richard. Last week... I, I think the last two sessions I've identified I'm a smoker. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do smoke in my car, but I don't smoke in my car when my, my uh, granddaughter or grandson are in, are in the car and I make sure that the, the car's well ventilated before I even pick them up. But the situation, the, the chap from Forrest be, basically said, and I've got a couple of questions along the, the lines that Convener went down. Um, the chap from Forrest said that this is the thin end of the wedge. You are targeting smokers now in their car with uh, children, but eventually someone will move on that uh, it will be smokers per se. Nobody can smoke in their car at all, even if there are no kids in the car. What, what, do, what do you say to that? I, the, yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Lowe, for that question. It, it's very clear this bill is very tight, extremely tight. It is only to do with the protection of children. Uh, it's, if people want to smoke wherever they want to smoke, that's fine. It's purely about protecting children. It is a, not an amendable bill that would any, in any way um, make it a, a, an offence for people to smoke generally in, in cars without children. And uh, I, there's nothing on the horizon that I can see that uh, would would change this bill to make that it would be an impossible. Right, to well, make. in regards to that answer, we're talking about children in cars. What about the same children that are sitting in their house at night time for their two parents smoke? And if we go back 30 years ago, uh, both my wife and I smoked. I, I no longer smoke in the house uh, because of my my grandchildren. I smoke outside. As I, I have to say that I see quite a lot of people doing nowadays. 
But what happens to the person who is, OK, I can't smoke my car uh, because my kids are there, but I can smoke my house. Are we going to have a law next to say people can't smoke in their house? Well, as I say, this law is, is abs cannot be amended to make it anything to do with what people do, do in their houses. It's purely about a vehicle. A vehicle, you're in a very enclosed space. The children have no option but to go into that car. Uh, to go on their trip to school, sometimes to the sports, bizarrely, or, or wherever. Uh, British Lung Foundation gave the evidence which showed the uh, smoking particles are 11 times thicker uh, in a car than, than they are in a pub. Yeah. So you're a very much of a difference. Of course, it may make some people think twice about smoking at home, and that's great uh, you know, when the kids are there. Uh, it would be, I think, it would be unenforceable to uh, legislate to stop people smoking in their private spaces of a house. I, I, I do sincerely hope so, but you know, as I say, I'm, I'm no longer smoking the house. But uh, my last question is: um, the police, as uh, the convener said last week, were happy to uh, uh, lend a hand on this, but not too happy about it. Uh, and you know, taking their, I think if I remember in one of the reports, they said taking their their, bo uh, their eye off uh, terrorism, etc. You know, to to go uh, about and look for somebody in a car smoking. And uh, I liked the other one where someone said, well, if the windows are tinted, I can't see. Uh, I've got two car seats in my car for my, my grandkids that you, can't, you could see uh, if these kids were in, in, you know, children are in the car. But how do you um, equate to the factor that, uh, again, uh, Forrest made out, you're going to employ, you're going to have police, you're going to have traffic wardens, you're going to have community cops, you're going to have community uh, uh, wardens. You're going to have environmental health officers. You know, if a car is stopped, parked in a car park, you're going to have the public. You know, so everybody's going to start to report people they see smoking in their cars. Do you think that's not a bit over the top? Uh, well, I mean, my initial bill was only for the police to enforce it. it has been the government who have. Uh, said that they, they would consider bringing an amendment regarding local authorities uh, and community wardens, etc. So uh, that, that aside, it would be up to them to uh, justify that. I'm quite happy if there's more people legislating on it. I think the fact that we have 60,000 children exposed to smoke, ev secondhand smoke in cars every week in Scotland, and we know the long-term effects, and we know that young children will tend to smoke themselves in later life if they're exposed to secondhand smoke in cars, and we know the, the socio-economic and health inequalities that this causes in Scotland that we have to act on. And as the Police Scotland said themselves, and the Law Society said themselves last week, that they all thought that this legislation was now necessary and uh, that enforcement wouldn't be needed drastically, as it has not been in other countries. Once enforced, we've noticed uh, huge differences in people's behaviour, I think, South Australia, something like 88% of uh, cars are now smoke-free smoke after uh, legislating. And in Canada, uh, as I said in my earlier remarks, I think uh, there was a 33% reduction in uh, uh, almost immediately from legislation being brought in there. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Dennis Robertson. Thank you, convener. And good afternoon, Mr. Hume. Um, I mean, I support... Uh, the whole idea of trying to ensure that children aren't exposed to secondhand smoke. <clears throat> but I still got a problem with regard to the enforcement aspect that uh, Nanette Milne was raising. If someone in the car is smoking, say going to collect a child for school, whatever, and they're just, you know, they're parked up and they're having a cigarette prior to the child coming out, that child's going to be exposed to that secondhand smoke after that person has finished smoking and got into the car. And we know that even if you dissipate the, the smoke by ventilation, the chemicals will still be there for quite some time. So with regard to that, I mean, this legislation isn't, isn't going to protect those children at all. Is it not better to try and raise the education and awareness of the harms of exposing children to smoke rather than imposing legislation, which would appear, at the moment anyway, to be um, unenforceable. I, well, uh, as we can see from other, other countries, I would dispute that it has, has been enforceable. But what we have seen is legislation has acted as a, as a, d a deterrent and behaviour has changed. 
uh, which is, I think, is what we are, we're all wanting. Uh, we're not wanting loads of people being criminalised, obviously, but. Uh, uh, by by these actions, so as I say, legislation is is there as, as a deterrent. We know it changes behaviour. Uh, we've got all the evidence as, uh, as you have in front of us that legislation in other countries has changed behaviour. You're quite right. If somebody is just out from smoking in a, a in a car, the toxins will s still be there. You can't see all. And just when you can't see smoke doesn't make say the toxins aren't still there. There's about 50 toxins, uh, some of them carcinogenic in tobacco smoke that causes such damage. So, um, But physically seeing somebody smoking in a car is fairly obvious and seeing, even if they have tinted glass, seeing there's a, a young child in the back is, is very obvious today. <coughs> there's little days I go out and we know the evidence from others uh, with the 60,000 journeys per week from Aberdeen, Aberdeen University gave that uh, statistic. That, that's a phenomenal amount. We know after the 2005 Act, I should also say that there was a significant drop in, in smoking, but over the last years that has actually levelled out. So uh, I, think, I think the evidence for legislation is very strong. I think what you've said to me, Mr Hume, is that taking forward the legislation will impact on people's behaviour, which is yeah, a good thing. I just still wonder whether or not your bill, because you've said, I think, about three times today already, the bill is very tight, you know, uh, to use your words. Um, and given that, uh, the restriction within your bill, I still find it very difficult to see how we're going to um, achieve the outcomes that, that you're looking for through legislation are you are you hopeful therefore that within the guidance there will be uh, an education program taken forward and really it's the education rather than the enforcement and this is why i i i think that the legislation uh, that you're bringing forward is, is somewhat flawed um because the, it really is about education and awareness rather than enforcement I mean, in the financial uh, memorandum, as you'll know, the, we have costed uh, an education programme in that, and it's yeah, it's related to take it take it right outside, which is also a Scottish government uh, mm. uh, programme on education. The very fact it's gained so much media attention will already have changed people's attitude. But we know that um, smoking in cars, is, as I said, education on that has been going on for, for decades. The dangers of second-hand smoke has been going on for decades, but still we have the, the 60,000 children every single week in Scotland being still exposed to second-hand smoke. We know the dangers that does to their health. They have no choice to go in that car. They can't hop on the bus or get a taxi or decide to take the train or the tram to, to, to school. They have to go in that. We know also, this was a Dr Rena Dewar who gave evidence to my um, uh, consultation uh, three years ago uh, when that went out, um, that it also causes great stress for children. Children are in the back of a car. They're being exposed to the smoke. They can't hold the breath for 10 minutes. They know the dangers themselves of being uh, exposed to that smoke. And the stress that that gives to them has been marked uh, quite... Uh, significantly, that was a Dr. Rena Dewar from University of Edinburgh, who um, gave me that evidence. Yeah, you see, you, you continue to cite the evidence, Mr. Hume, and, and, and I, I appreciate all the evidence is there, and certainly the evidence from Aberdeen University and the British Lung Foundation, etc. And I, I can I understand all that, and I understand the impact it has on children and their behaviour later in life. <laughs> Where I'm coming from is, it's about education and awareness, and I'm just trying to trying to you know tease out from you is is the legislation absolutely necessary in terms of and you say you don't want to criminalize people so is it not about education awareness and the legislation itself is not appropriate in terms of trying to take this message forward the law society i thought the legislation was necessary police scotland stated to yourself that the legislation is necessary we've we've not seen a reduction of smoking in in, in kids with cars to any, any significance it's still still very prevalent there's there's uh, still people have the belief that opening the window makes a difference where 
we know it it can make no real difference and uh, and in conversation with Dr Sean Semple who's seen as the, uh, the lead on this in, in the UK at least uh, he said that his worst case of particles per metre squared density of smoke in a car was actually when the, the window was, was ajar and, and so it's not working uh, we need more and we need the backing up of legislation to uh, get any progress from now Thanks, Dennis. Um, uh, Mike McKenzie. Thank you, convener. Um, I uh, um, support the general principles of the bill, but I've got some concerns similar to Nanette Melner about the enforcement. And um, the m my understanding is that it will operate on the basis of a fixed penalty. And my concern really is that I think in my question of Police Scotland last week, um, I wasn't reassured that they wouldn't feel under some pressure to produce a set of enforcement statistics. Some of your colleagues have been on record as complaining about the target-driven culture within Police Scotland, um, and that that would give rise to some injustices. Uh, given it's you know a form of summary justice, fixed penalty, um, which a lot of people wouldn't challenge in the court, but equally it goes hand in hand. I understand the level of penalty being considered as something in the order of £100. I could be wrong about that. Um, but would you accept that there will be some injustices, um, inevitably? Um, would you accept that the £100 penalty would bear disproportionately, for instance, on um, uh, people of slender means, perhaps pensioners and so on? And given that You've just described the biggest effect of the bill will be in the changing of the culture. Do you not think that supports a case for a fixed penalty that's maybe ten or twenty pounds? Well, the the, the figure of a hundred pounds of my in, uh, initial consultation, it was uh, it consulted on sixty pounds, and that was relating exactly to what the the spot fine is for a seatbelt fine, <coughs> and exactly the same amount that is for a mobile phone. Um, that was the rationale for that. Uh, during the consultation process, of course, uh, <laughs> that was changed to £100. That's why this is at £100. You, you also mentioned about socio-economic uh, and really health inequalities uh, uh, as well. And um, we know in some socio-economic groups that uh, health is a, a much larger issue, as is smoking a much larger issue. And I'll just reiterate what this is about. This is about protecting children uh, from secondhand smoke damage at a very vulnerable age, which can lead to uh, problems immediately and in the future. Okay, thank you. I'm a bit disappointed that you're not more concerned with the potential injustices, but uh, I'll move uh, on. Uh, I'll uh, move uh, on. Um, the the Law Society last week, when they were given evidence, um, suggested that, and you can perhaps just clarify this. I'm abs I'm, I'm not quite clear that whether the person, uh, the liable person, would be the smoker themselves in the car or the driver. Mm -hmm. um, the Law Society seemed to suggest it should be the driver. Um, I was a bit concerned about that in as much as if I was driving my car and I'd given Richard a lift and he lit up a cigarette on a motorway where I couldn't stop or somehow kick him out of the door and... <laughs> You know, an eagle, an, eag that. an eagle. I know I never would. I'm, I'm just dramatising the situation to make the point. But and an eagle-eyed policeman happened to spot this. Mm -hmm. That I, as the driver, would be liable. And again, I feel that would give rise to an injustice. Um, could you clarify the situation? Yeah, absolutely. I can and, and also your views on whether or not it ought to be the driver, or perhaps also the driver. I, I clarify that it would be the driver, but it would also be the adults who's smoking as well. So this is, uh, this is a, a health issue, and it, it's not about just being the driver. It's about the, so the adult. Yeah, it's a, as I said, it's only the adult, and if that adult is the driver, that's that's fine. And if it's a passenger, that would be the person also. So it's not. I think the driver has enough to do with driving his car rather than trying to stop other adults smoking in his car. Mm -hmm. It's the quite clearly the adult that's in my bill. Other people have talked about other issues and I know it's different perhaps south of the border where, the, where it is the, the driver, it's a motoring offence. This is a health of, uh, offence, it's health we're trying to look after the children, so it, it's the mm. adult, whether it's a passenger or the driver. Okay, thank you. Nanette has got a supplementary arising from that exchange. It's just something that's just coming to my head. I mean, I, I, it's, 
everyone's talking about children, as in small children and car seats, that sort of thing. Um, but and we're talking about the responsibility of being the driver or the passenger. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it's illegal to buy cigarettes under the age of 18. I'm not sure it's illegal to actually smoke under the age of 18. Now, supposing you had a passenger in your car who was 17 and smoking. I mean, I, I, the only, and he's the only one that's in the car that's under 18. I mean, it, uh, is, is he there for committing a criminal offence? I mean, it, it's it's almost the, the upper boundary of upper age limit that's bothering me. We had a lot of we had a lot of debate about that that very po uh, point. I mean, my initial proposal was uh, 16 uh, and therefore 15, 15 or, or under, uh, but it came out in uh, in my, the consultation process that. Uh, you're quite correct that it's illegal to buy uh, cigarettes when you're 17 or, or under. Uh, 18 is what the law society considered to be an adult, 17 uh, a, a junior. So the, the final bill was was to coincide with that 18 to make it much more simpler. Uh, you're, you're talking about whether it be uh, somebody would be um, liable if they were 17. Uh, my bill is suggesting no, they would not be liable because um, I'm not really wanting to criminalise children because uh, in the eyes of the law, uh, a 17-year-old is a child. So, so really, I mean, the driver there would be would be guilty of allowing a 17-year-old to smoke in his car, but the 17-year-old wouldn't be guilty if it's only the child in the car? Uh, no, no, not if the, not if they're all, not if the driver or, or the adult or or, <laughs> or that any person is is uh, seventeen, they wouldn't be liable because it's only for eighteen year olds or up, upwards that would be liable. No, but the driver would be liable for if, that symptom smoking. If the driver, sorry, can you clarify what, what age your driver is? If the seventeen year old is smoking, the, the, he's not guilty of an offence. Oh yeah, and, and, and the driver the was driver 18, 18 above. No, oh, an adult it, driver. No, it, it, the it. driver the driver wouldn't be. Uh, committing a, an offence, it's only the smoker if they're 18 years older. older. Okay. I'm still a bit confused, but I'll, I'll think about that one. Well, that's quite right. Can, 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 I, can I clarify, Mr. Hume? The reply to Mike McKenzie there um, if the police stopped a car and the driver wasn't the smoker, mm -hmm. but his wife was in the front with him and there are two kids in the back and she was smoking. Mm -hmm. Who are, are we talking about? One ticket, one 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 hundred pound, charging the driver, or are we no. talking about one uh, two one hundred pounds charging both? Who gets charged? Right, you're suggesting that the driver isn't smoking and he's over eighteen. The, the wife is over eighteen and she's smoking, yes. and the two children in the back. It would yeah. only be the, the wife who was over eighteen. Right, so she's charged. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Rhoda. Grant. Thank you. Um, can I just um, ask some questions around um, the exception for um, vehicles that are used as a home? And what do you, I, I'm a bit concerned that this may be a loophole. I mean, you're talking. One of the phrases is human habitation, um, so that doesn't necessarily say it's a mobile home. It's a vehicle of any kind that's used for human habitation for not less than one night. So would someone sleeping overnight in a car be an exemption? Um, and could that not be used as a loophole? Or was, how would you prove that that car had been used for human habitation? Well, again, not? it would be up to the, the police to, to interpret. I mean, I have it in there that it would be not for no less than one night. Um, a car wouldn't that it's parked up and somebody's sleeping in it wouldn't be exempted. That, that's quite tight in there. But I want to be very careful that I do not want to legislate for in, in people's homes, and therefore I do. I, that's why I have the exemption for uh, the motor homes. Some people, as we know, use motor homes for for their for their living accommodation, for living in, and uh, um, or or being on holiday with, and that for me would be exempted. But of course, if they were using those homes driving uh, as we wouldn't use a normal private motor vehicle then they wouldn't be exempt so it's quite clear would it would it not be easier to say a motor home rather than um, you know a vehicle used for human habitation I wouldn't want to see exempted somebody driving the motor home every day day in day out uh, uh, being exempted therefore it would be only when it was using for what we would call uh, living in sleeping in but a, a, as a motor home so a normal car, if someone was living in their normal car? Would not be exempted by this, and that's quite clear in the, the legislation here. 
Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Colin? Uh, you can be the afternoon to you, Mr. Afternoon, Keenan. Colin. Um, <coughs> it's actually the terminology surrounding convertible vehicles that mm -hmm. had me confused because there are so many different types. And I mean, and should, you know, the, we have a situation where the uh, in a convertible vehicle it is possible to, for instance, run with the windows up at the side. Mm -hmm. And given the obviously the air coming across what is the roof area, forcing down any per particular smoke, how do you determine what is a convertible and exempt? Vehicle. My legislation. Uh, there has been some confusion, I think, at the committee on this point, because with my legislation, legislation there is no exemption for convertible uh, motor vehicles at all. The Scottish Government have talked about it, and I've discussed it with them, and they seem quite uh, soft on it, but I agree with you completely. Um, putting your windows up is and, and taking the roof down uh, still causes quite a, uh, can cause quite a, a lot of uh, second-hand smoke issues. So my, my legislation is quite clear that there is no exemption for convertible vehicles whatsoever. Uh, and, that, and that is, uh, to be honest, I'll be sticking quite clearly on that. Mm -hmm. So there's just one extra thing. It's just what you said um, earlier on in one of your statements to, or one of the answers to one of my colleagues. But um, in terms of the ability to see through tinted windows, um, which normally I would imagine the tint is usually within the, the, the rear windows and quite a lot of models have clear um, front passenger and driver as well as obviously the uh, uh, the front of the vehicle. But you, you, you seem to suggest that it was rather easy to determine who was in the back of these things. I'm, I'm not quite so sure that I agree with you there. Um, from what I've Obviously, when this was brought up some time ago, it's amazing how you look around the, the roads as people drive past you, and no, it isn't that easy to determine uh, what's there. So it comes back to this in, in enforcement issue, the identification, the fact that the police see difficulties, the um, local authorities see difficulties in parts, but how confident really are you that this could be seen as a law that is feasible? Well, just to clarify that, I, I know find that your front windows, your side windows at the front, your your windscreen uh, can't be tinted to any great mm -hmm. degree at all. That that is illegal because it causes, uh, obviously, issues for drivers seeing uh, mm -hmm. properly uh, in in the, the wrong the same light reason conditions. Looking in as well, if you're looking at but, the back. Uh, as I, as I <laughs> said, the front the front the, the front is is open, so that there is a good there is a good vision into half of the vehicle. Of course, it's more difficult to see through smoky glass. It's more difficult to see what happens in the in the back of a van. But as I said, the local authority and Police Scotland, even with all that knowledge, uh, realise that uh, and have stated that this legislation they believe is, is uh, absolutely necessary. And again, if you look at all the evidence of all the other countries, and happy to, you will have a lot of it in, in your papers, the change in people's behaviour when this legislation came in was quite phenomenal, and that's what we were. This legislation is about. Yeah, sorry. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Um, I think it's important also to to state at this point that the committee seem to be focusing on the vehicles that are in motion. This doesn't necessarily need to apply to vehicles that are in motion. This can apply to vehicles that are stationary as well. Um, Police Scotland mentioned last week the whole idea of they will be focusing on their principal duties, as they see it, in terms of road safety. Now, part of those duties might involve looking out for what they might consider would be um, in the interest of road safety, so they might be looking out for potential offences. They could pull a motorist over, for example, in relation to one offence. When the motorist is pulled over, it may become clear to the officers at that point <coughs> that there are young children in the back, or children that are under 18, and somebody is smoking who happens to be an adult. There would be nothing under the terms of the legislation as presented to say that the police officer or the enforcement officer at that point wouldn't be able to, you know, either draw the adult's attention to the fact that they were smoking they were potentially committing an offence there, or to, to go through the process of issuing a fixed penalty notice. Um, this is a system that works actually in, in the United States. 
uh, lot of their legislation, uh, smoking um, in cars legislation, has actually been put forward as a secondary offence. So, so if a vehicle is stationary, then an officer would be able to issue, you know, a ticket. An offence would be being committed if an officer could determine that. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the fact that it could become a secondary offence or anything. I'm just thinking in terms of the ability for people to actually look inside vehicles clearly and see that this is happening. But if, if an officer and, and is... I, I understand that there is obviously the driving element as well. I do, I do take a yeah, more what yeah. you're saying about stationary vehicles and secondary offences, but I don't think that's where the argument really was being faced. Well, I mean, sort of, uh, yeah, through, through the convener, I mean, uh, I, I hate repeating things, but I, I will repeat things. If, <laughs> if we've looked at... Uh, just 2000, the year 2013-14, uh, if you look at the, the seatbelt and the mobile phone law, but just the seatbelt, 136,000 in one <coughs> year were detected, and these will be seatbelts that are equally in the back as, as they are in the front. So, yes, of course it will be more difficult if you've got very dark smoky glass, but it doesn't make it say that it's, it's not impossible. And as I said uh, several times before, we know that legislation happening in other countries has uh, changed behaviour, and that's what this is, is all about, protection of children. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what the police were saying. Mm -hmm. you know, they will enforce seatbelt you know, law and road traffic safety, etc. That's a remit. Yeah. What they were saying is that they're not empowered to deal with a, a health matter. Well, I mean, that, that was a basic plea, wasn't it? This you know? is, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Road traffic is a very immediate health health matter uh, because it can uh -huh. act, 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 it can result in people being hurt. This is a longer term health matter where hurt is done over many years. As, as it, it's just in, in the issue of mm -hmm. enforcement. That. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody would expect them to move, uh, as has been quoted by some media, move the resources from uh, a serious criminal uh, offence to uh, stopping people in smoking. Evidence that I got from uh, police were, was that they would do it as part of their normal duties. Well, the evidence, the evidence that we can go with mm -hmm. is on the record here last week, so mm -hmm. familiar, familiarise yourself with that, I think. Bob Doris, I think, is our last question today as we, we, as we, we move we move on to our next item of business, which is in private. Bob? Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Duncan. Um, Mr Hume, just um, another aspect of something we received in written evidence we wanted to give you the opportunity to respond to on, on the record uh, this afternoon. Some of our written submissions have suggested the bill could extend perhaps to those who are over 18 who could be determined to be vulnerable adults, whether it's learning disabilities or or, or whatever groups. And we got that in written submissions. We want to consider all, all the submissions we've had when doing our stage one report. So I'd give you the opportunity to put on your record how you feel about that proposal. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think it's absolutely wrong that anybody, um, any vulnerable adult, should be ex exposed to uh, smoking second-hand cars. They're very similar to children. They probably don't have the option to go on um, public transport, etc. It was something we considered uh, for, for in great depth before we started this journey and uh, our, our concern was you know, how can the police actually identify somebody who is a, a vulnerable adult it's not that obvious whereas a child you know, can, can be quite a bit more obvious than a, a vulnerable adult so we decided uh, to, to leave that out to give this a better chance and uh, hopefully people will take that message on board and not smoke when there's vulnerable ch adults also present in the car, but it's not part of the legislation. If someone wants to bring that amendment forward and it's, it, it enforces, it, it, it strengthens this bill, then I'd be happy to look at that, obviously. Thank you, Mr. Put that on the Thank you. I, I don't think we've got any more questions. Can I thank, thank, you. Uh, thank, thank you all for your attendance here and giving us the evidence that you have. Um, thank you. Um, we... We now uh, go on to our next item of business, which we previously agreed, which is item seven. Previously agreed, we were dealing with in private. Thank you. Thank you.